The Bloods and Crips, founded by leather jacket wearing, fist fighting high school teenagers. Did you know that? I did not. The Crips were founded by two high schoolers named Raymond Washington and Stanley Tookie Williams, who formed an alliance to protect their neighborhoods from other young people who were harassing them. And maybe so they could dish out some beatdowns and engage in some petty theft as well. Quickly, what started out as teenagers getting into brawls to prove who was the king of the block evolved into something completely different, something that has led to over 15,000 murders over a 50-year period. Stanley Williams and Raymond Washington could not have known what their small street gang was going to turn into. Today, the Bloods and Crips are known all over the country for their violent crimes like drive-by shootings committed against rivals and innocent bystanders alike, but it wasn't always like that. For years, they were not all over the country. They were localized to South Central Los Angeles. The conditions in South Central Los Angeles created a perfect breeding ground for gang violence. Young black men growing up with a lack of community resources, police officers who hated them, wanted to keep them out of white neighborhoods. Many of the civil rights leaders and Black Panthers they once looked up to had been assassinated or sentenced to lengthy prison terms, leaving an opening for youth street gangs to rise to power in Los Angeles. With strong bonds formed through years of shared experiences of racism, discrimination, police brutality, a consistent lack of economic opportunities in the only neighborhoods Black residents were allowed to live in for decades, the Bloods and Crips took over their respective territories and enforced their boundaries with astonishing brutality. The murder and crime rates in Los Angeles skyrocketed. The crack cocaine epidemic only added to this and allowed the Bloods and Crips to expand across the entire United States through new alliances formed with various drug cartels. Rap music, movies, and in the modern age, social media have glamorized the gangster lifestyle, leading more and more young people to desire to be a member of the Bloods and Crips, not realizing what the gang life is really about in many cases until it's too late. Today, I'm going to break down the history of how and why these two street gangs starting off as one street gang formed in South Central Los Angeles. We're going to introduce you to the founders of the Bloods and Crips, speculate as to how we could help fix the legacy of gang violence the Bloods and Crips have left in America. With today's, if you don't address the source of the wound, you're never going to stop the bleeding. We need to finally wake the fuck up edition of Time Suck. This is Michael McDonald, and you're listening to Time Suck. (laughs) You're listening to Time Suck. Happy Monday, Meat Sacks. Welcome to the Cult of the Curious. 318 straight weeks of learning something new. So much to learn today, especially informative and thought-provoking episode, at least for me. I'm Dan Cummins, suck nasty meat sack with an attitude. Taurus, for whatever that's worth. And you're listening to Time Suck. Uh, Did have fun in Boston last week at Laugh Boston, as I had hoped. Uh, Man, the show is so much fun. Grand Rapids is next, followed by Austin, Louisville, Portland, and Minneapolis. And that's it for 2022. And then kicking things off in 2023 in Spokane, then Boise, St. Louis, Kansas City, Sacramento, Denver. Going to be hitting New Orleans, so many other spots. Tickets to all these spots at dancummins.tv. And at badmagicmerch.com, continuing the Halloween costume theme this week, none other than the devil himself, Pogo the Clown. A bright yet dark portrait of Chicago's most notorious serial killer, John Wayne Gacy, on a black tee, also available in our new poster section. Very cool. Head on over to badmagicmerch.com. Check that out. And you can buy tickets while you're there to the Bad Magic Halloween show, Scared to Death Live Haunted Halloween, True Tales of Hallow's Eve Horror 2. I'll be telling Halloween-themed horror tales live online Thursday, October 27, 6 p.m. Pacific time, and Lindsay will too. We'll be all dressed up. If you miss the 27th, uh, you can spend Halloween with us. You can get a ticket. You can watch the show until the afternoon of November 3rd. Watch it as many times as you want during these seven days that it'll be available. You can go to badmagicmerch.com for tickets. And now it's gang time. Getting right to it. I'm going to throw out a lot of stats for the first half of this episode, and then uh, I'll get more into the personal statements, more of a narrative back half in the podcast. First, going to break down what a gang like the Bloods or Crips even is. Like, how, how are they defined? How are they structured? How do they compare to, like, the Mafia? How do you join them? I'll share information regarding how prevalent they are around the U.S. Where are they located? I'll share information regarding how deadly they are, how many murders are being committed. Then we'll dig into the socioeconomic factors that lead people into wanting to join street gangs. And that will lead specifically into why these two gangs formed in South Central Los Angeles as opposed to literally anywhere else in the world, anywhere else in America. That might be my favorite part. We'll learn how South Central's, you know, very... uh specific history created a perfect environment for these gangs to form and how looking back it it almost feels inevitable that they did form based on the conditions around them 
Then it'll be timeline time where we will learn, uh, where we meet, excuse me, the co-founders of the Crips, Raymond Washington and Stanley Tookie Williams, see how the formation of the Crips then led directly to the formation of the Bloods. We'll examine how these two gangs have mutated and changed over the years. I'll share thoughts along the way and at the end regarding how, unless we change our you know, current punitive strategy, these gangs will probably never go away. Or I guess why rather than how. So let's jump in and let's uh, let's get started with a very interesting episode. All right, starting off, as I said, by talking about what a gang even is. From 1996 to 2012, the National Gang Center, a project funded by the U.S. Department of Justice to provide U.S. law enforcement with specialized training for countering street gang crimes, conducted an annual survey of law enforcement agencies to assess gang problems in the U.S. Their sample consisted of over 2,500 different law enforcement agencies from all over the country, from big cities, suburbs, small cities, rural areas, Each year, they received about an 85% response rate from these agencies. That's a great engagement rate. So the feedback they got seems to have clearly fairly uh, represented law enforcement nationwide. And one of the questions the study asked was simply, what is a gang? Might seem like a stupid question at first glance, but there is still currently no real universal definition for a gang in the U.S. that captures what the Bloods and Crips uh, have represented. I mean, look it up in the dictionary. And you're going to get pretty vague definitions like uh, an organized group of criminals or a group of young people involved in petty crime or violence. The Bloods and Crips fit both definitions, but so do so many other groups uh, who are not nearly the same as them. Like uh, five friends in school who agreed to pull off a home burglary together, technically a gang. But it's not one uh, any member of a set of Bloods or Crips would likely respect as any sort of criminal peer. Another dictionary definition of a gang is simply a group of people, especially young people who regularly associate together. That definition is way too loose. My 16-year-old son, Kyler, regularly hangs out with a group of uh, male friends he refers to as the boys. Going to be meeting up with the boys. Play some soccer. Going to hang out with the boys after the game. Going bowling tomorrow night with the boys. Are they a gang? Uh, Technically, yeah. But uh, the boys are not a gang like the Bloods and Crips. Uh, the Bloods and Crips would eat the boys alive. Uh, the more specific labels of street gang, youth gang, criminal street gang are used interchangeably by law enforcement to describe many gangs, according to that same National Gang Center report. All three of these terms apply to the Bloods and Crips. Members tend to be real young because the life expectancy of a gang member is sadly so young and they sadly get started so young. Uh, they definitely engage in criminal activity. They do operate on the streets. The NGC writes the term street gang carries two specific meanings that increase its practical value. First, it suggests a common feature of gangs. They commonly have a street presence. Street socialization is a key feature of adolescent gangs. Second, this term also refers to street crimes. That is serious and violent crimes, such as assaults, drive-by shootings, robberies, homicides that occur on the streets, often are of concern to citizens and policymakers. The ongoing commission of these offenses consequently instills fear amongst residents, undermining informal social control mechanisms within the community. Okay, so street gang, better than the less precise gang. Law enforcement agencies submitted responses ranking characteristics that define a street gang in order of importance. Law enforcement agencies that uh, group uh, criminality or say a group was the most important factor in determining a, a street gang, defining one, group criminality. After that was has a name, displays colors or other symbols, hangs out together, claims turf or territory, and has a leader or leaders. Okay, all makes sense. Other criteria to define a street gang can be according to law enforcement feedback. Three or more members, usually age 12 to 24, right? So young. Uh, Members sharing a common identity, like a name and other symbols. Members considering themselves to be a gang And, and I think this is uh, way more important than the first part, others who know of them also considering them to be a gang. I really like that last criteria, actually. I mean, if no one else thinks you're in a gang, despite you and your crew telling people that you're in a gang, are you really in a gang? Or are you just a poser, a wannabe, who thinks that they're in a gang? I mean, it sounds like in that scenario, maybe you're a a gangbanger in the same way that former suck subject Mark uh, Bitchell Twitchell, the Dexter killer, was a movie director. Maybe you're a gangster like former suck subject Paul Bernardo, half of the Ken and Barbie killers, you know, was a uh, was a rapper with all his deadly innocence bullshit. Remember that guy? It's been a while since we talked about him. 
still love this beat. Remember his dope rhyme? RCMP, never gonna catch me. Canada's most wanted still walking free. The million dollar man with the billion dollar plan. Deadly innocence, rocking in the gold sedan. You think I'm innocent? Behind this, I'm packing a lot of deadliness. So come at me. Come at me. I got a fucking nice face. <laughs> uh-huh. I like the girls and the girls like me. They like it when I'm peeping and I beat it by a tree. Bush beaten. Bush beaten. Bush, bu- bush beaten. Bush beaten. Bush beaten. Bush beaten. Uh, I know it's been a minute <laughs> since that episode. That was a little mashup of lines that I came up with for Paul and Paul's original lyrics. I can't take credit for the nice face line. That was all Paul, all of his lyrical genius. That still cracks me up. He thought that was a fucking dope lyric. I got a nice, I got, no, I got a fucking nice face. Anyway, uh, forgot, forgot about that idiot. All right. So a, a real street gang, like the Bloods and Crips, they know they're in a gang and other people for sure know they're in a gang, a gang, uh, you'd want to think twice about before fucking with more criteria from the NGC. They have permanence and a degree of organization. I like the word permanence here. We're not talking about a group of people who decided to band together to take down another gang and then go about their separate ways or who've come together to rob a few banks and then run off with the riches, lead new lives. No, this is a group of people who don't plan on going anywhere. They don't plan on not being in the gang at some point. A group that plans on continuing to make money in illicit ways for as long as humanly possible. Which brings me to the final NGC criteria. The group is involved in criminal activity, right? Take away the criminal activity part and the term gang can be replaced with just a group, club, organization or something. The NGC also answered the question, how are street gangs different from organized crime, terrorist groups, prison gangs, motorcycle gangs? Well, gang researcher Malcolm Klein wrote, in each of these instances, the word gang implies a level of structure and organization for criminal conspiracy that is simply beyond the capacity of most street gangs, right? They're not as organized. Most street gangs are only loosely structured with transient leadership and membership, easily transcended codes of loyalty, and informal rather than formal roles for the members. That's what makes this uh, street gang different than like a terrorist group. Much more formal structure. All right, interesting. Uh, unlike I- even the somewhat loosely organized Hells Angels, a typical Blood or Crip set doesn't normally have a clubhouse. No headquarters. Uh, looser than that. Look at a more NGC literature when talking about hierarchy. It says Crips have no charter or national hierarchy. They are instead a loose association of local self-governing sets. And you can say the same thing for Bloods. These sets determine their own name and formal structure. Crip set structures may vary from no formal leadership to a hierarchy consisting of a leader, lieutenants, drug coordinators, soldiers, drug couriers. All depends on the set and depends on the time you're talking about the set. Uh, Reminds me again of when we talked about the Hells Angels, right? There's uh, not a super formal leadership system. Clubs do have leaders, members who are fully patched, prospects who want to be fully patched, et cetera. But whatever rules there are vary from clubhouse to clubhouse, you know, from, uh, yeah, club to club, charter to charter, you know, set to set in this case. They're largely verbal rules. There's no like written code. The rules in the hierarchy or whatever the current person in charge uh, fucking says they are. Sometimes in some sets, it can be even kind of hard to figure out who exactly is in charge. The mafia, for comparison, according to the FBI, much more agreed upon formal structure. Right at the top, each mafia family, rough equivalent of uh, individual bloods or crips, you know, gang sets, uh, which can be over a thousand members strong, like the notorious bounty hunter Watts Bloods Gang, which has around 2,000 members, centered around uh, Nickerson Gardens, a huge housing project in Watts. Biggest housing project west of the Mississippi, actually, with over a thousand apartment units. That gang has numerous sets within it. The Lot Boys, Block Boys, Bell Haven, Ace Line, Deuce Line, Tray Line, Four Line, Five Line. Right? There isn't one Bloods gang or one Crips gang. Things have mutated and gotten so messy since these gangs got started that some uh, Crips gangs, uh, you know, fight other Crips gangs, Bloods gangs, fight other Bloods gangs, etc. Just like some mafia families fight other mafia families. Uh, Back to mafia structure. Each family has a clear leader, right? The mafia, the boss or the Don, you know, like, uh, like in the Godfather, you know, Don Corleone, Marlon Brando. Uh, Not all bloods, uh, Crips gangs have a clear leader. Sets often evolve, uh, break away into their own new gangs, new leaders. Leaders die all the time or imprisoned. Not agreed upon way to figure out who the next leader is going to be. Uh, there is with the mafia beneath the mafia boss is the underboss, the, the next in line, clear and powerful second in command. Typically a family member, generally a son being groomed to take over the family business. Then there is the uh, con- consigliere, 
uh, probably saying it wrong, Cantalire, Cantalire, uh, third in command. I heard numerous different pronunciations. Trusted friend, confidant to the boss, counselor, advisor, often a lawyer. Beneath these three are the capos. Capos similar to military captains who command soldiers. Capos each run a crew of soldiers. These are made men, just like the top three members are made men as well. Made men are ranking mafia members who are not to be fucking touched unless you want your crew or your family to be touched. You don't fuck with a made man without risking your life. Traditionally, all these guys are Italian as are other soldiers. There is not the same race lines when Bloods and Crips. The soldiers, these guys are actually commonly known as made men, the lowest members of the crime family, but still highly respected. They take an oath to never share details of the operation with law enforcement, to never betray the family. Once you're a made man, you're, you're in for life. You don't get to decide to just not be in the mafia anymore unless you want to look over your shoulder for the rest of your days and worry about being whacked. Some families, to become a made man, you have to kill someone for the family. Right? The equivalent in uh, Bloods and Crips would be to uh, probably to, to jump someone. We'll talk about getting jumped in or having to jump somebody to uh, enter the gang later. Finally, below these soldiers are associates. Associates are part of a mafia crew ran by a capo but are not made men. Maybe they're not Italian, not eligible. Or they're guys who have valuable criminal skills but don't want to commit their lives fully to the mafia. Guns for hire, other criminal types. And there's an equivalent with Bloods and Crips. You know, like a lot of people claim uh, not to be in a Blood set or a Crips set, but they're affiliated. That word gets used a lot. They're friendly with the gang. Historically, that has been the criminal structure of the mafia in America, right? There, and again, there's no exact direct equivalent with Bloods and Crips. Much more loose. More variance, again, from gang to gang, set to set. So how do you join the Bloods or Crips? Well, you ask nicely uh, is, is one way you can do it. You don't always have to be jumped in or jump somebody. You can just say something like, uh, and this is from just some, some gang research I did. Excuse me, kind sir. I was hoping you might care to enlist my services in some of your unlawful enterprises. I'm happy to provide a resume and list of references regarding my prior villainous and felonious pursuits. And then if they're agreeable to your offer, you'll meet with the gang leader, usually at their private office or perhaps less formally in a fine dining establishment setting. No, 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 no. Typically, you uh, you get introduced to members. Maybe you've better made a bit of a name for yourself as a tough kid, a kid who doesn't rat, a kid who can handle himself around cops, other gangsters. Maybe deal a bit of drugs. You're running some kind of other racket that uh, comes to a gang's attention, right? They uh, see that you're enterprising, profitable. Maybe you grew up around gang members, and when you're of a certain age, you just get invited. There's kind of an expectation that you're going to join. There's a variety of ways. At some point, you either ask or they ask you. And then usually it seems to make it official, you are jumped in, right? Vice uh, released a YouTube video in late 2017 titled Inside a Gang Initiation with Silent with the Silent Murder Crips. Uh, that's that set of Crips uh, out in Brooklyn to at least uh, take a peek at what it takes to join a typical Crip set. The Silent Murder Crips, according to one of the guys who's part of their leadership, about 90 dudes, a dozen of which operate out of Brooklyn. That's where the video took place. Uh, the rest are said in the video to vaguely be based somewhere down south, wherever that is. In this video, young man who goes by JT called a prospect. This dude, again, uh, reminds me of uh, Hell's Angels. He's been hanging around this set, committing some crimes, not fully a member. He's an affiliate. And now he meets up with, uh, you know, full members at a playground. Guys who he considers his closest friends, his family. He keeps saying family. And three of these men chosen by the gang leader are there to, quote, jump him in. Uh, they will swing the jump rope and he better fucking double dutch his ass off. He's got to show some skills or he's never going to become a full member. Mm -mm. This is your one chance to jump, 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 jump. You fucking gangster ass off. No, uh, jumping him means they're going to beat the shit out of him. I wish it was double dutch. That'd be uh, a nice little twist. Now, the man claiming to lead this set, CeeLo, calling himself an SMC OG, said that JT has to do this to prove that he can handle himself, that he can rep the game, that he can rep the Crips. He has to fight his way out. JT, born in Washington, D.C., basic street dealer who met some Crips, became friendly with a few, possibly sold drugs for some members, and then wanted to join. He told Vice, I want to be around my brothers more, making more. The way I'm moving right now is good, but I'd be moving better, right, selling more drugs, if I had something extra behind me. That's family. He goes on to say that even if he didn't join the gang, since he's already dealing drugs, he can still get caught, still go to jail. So there's, what's the risk basically? Like, why not? He can still get killed. He said his sister was shot and killed in a drive-by and she wasn't in a gang. So might as well join up with the gang and have protection in numbers. He clearly seems to feel that running in the, the kinds of neighborhoods full of this type of violence is just the only world available to him. He talks about how he only wants to be around people who understand where he's coming from, people who will look out for each other, people who will look out for him. And how sad that he doesn't even entertain the possibility 
of trying to start somewhere else fresh. You know, I'd take a chance on living an entirely different kind of life to say fuck it to the uh, entirety uh, or the entire way of this, this life he's been around and just bounce. Doesn't seem like he actually has actual family nearby. He could uh, save some of the drug money he's currently making, apply online to get a job somewhere else, anywhere else, take a bus ticket, start over. I'm not saying that would be easy. It'd be fucking super hard. But would it be harder than being a crip? Probably end up with a better life expectancy. The beatdown JT gets in this video is fucking rough to watch. It was supposed to be three on one. Some other dude got excited, teed it off with a big old haymaker sucker punch, and it became four on one. And, and these other grown men hitting him, they are not pulling punches. Like no weapons are being used, but they go full force. Like they're, they're going for blood and they get some blood. They don't knock him out, but they come real close. They for sure gave him a concussion. I mean, his bell was fucking rung when he had to, uh, uh, tried to walk away. Took him, took him a little while to get his bearings. Both his eyes quickly almost swollen shut. And then after the pain subsided a bit, he was happy. He's a crip now, right? Mission accomplished. Well, JT got himself uh, beat to get in the gang. Anecdotally, I have heard plenty of other stories about uh, you know people having to jump others to get into one of these gangs. You have to beat the fuck out of someone. The gang picks for you. Fuck up some kid at school, some random kid from the neighborhood. But with some gangs, you might even have to kill a stranger or kill a rival gang member to get in. So how many people have gone through something like this? How many have gotten jumped or jumped someone else? While there aren't stats on Bloods and Crips specifically, from 1996 to 2012, right, the NGC report again, they did monitor overall street gang membership in the U.S., they found a decline in gang activity from the mid-90s to the early 2000s, uh, but then it increased uh, from 2001 to 2005. Overall number of gang members, uh, pretty consistent, actually, from 96 to 2012. Uh, 846,500 members in 1996, 850,000 members in 2012, right? Uh, you know, pretty close to a million people, so many. The estimated number of gangs, about the same too, 30,800 in 1996, 30,700. In 2012, for whatever reason, nationwide stats like these don't seem to have been published uh, since 2012 in the past decade. Every source I find cites either this study or even older studies. Typically back between 1996 and 2012, and I imagine today as well, gangs were more prevalent in larger cities than rural counties. In 1996, 86.2% of large U.S. cities defined as any city with over 50,000 people experienced, quote, gang problems. 59.4% of suburban counties experienced gang problems and even 37.9% of small cities with just 2,500 to 50,000 people experienced gang problems. Damn. 26.3% of rural counties experienced gang problems. 2012, 85.6% of large cities experienced gang problems. 49.5% of uh, suburban counties. 25.4% of smaller cities and 16% of rural counties. So, no, uh, yeah, a lot, uh, very prevalent. Uh, no shocker, but it doesn't seem to be a lot of uh, gang problems here in uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, from what I can tell. A website called InsidePrison.com tracks regional gang activity. Estimates that there are less than 100 gang members in Kootenai, Kootenai County, which uh, Coeur d'Alene sits inside. And the site says gang activity is decreasing. Uh, back in 2007, Kootenai County Sheriff Rocky Watson said there were 20 documented gang members in the county. So not, not too many. Never been a real issue here. I personally have been so lucky with this shit, right? Worried about gangs has uh, never been something I've uh, had to do. While I've lived a few miles from uh, gangs, you know, when I lived in Santa Monica, never thought about them, never saw them that I was aware of, never saw any gang violence that I was aware of. When I lived in a big apartment complex in Las Vegas, when I was a freshman, sophomore in high school, I heard of gangs, uh, new kids at school who supposedly ran with gang bangers or even dated them. Supposedly there was bloods and crips at our school. Didn't know anyone. Uh, you know, in one of these gangs for sure. Uh, they didn't run in my neighborhood that I knew of. The building I lived in supposedly it did get shot up one night shortly before we moved. Uh, other side of the building, not the one I lived in. I heard it was gang related, targeting someone living in one of those apartments, but I don't remember being scared. I don't remember seeing anyone rolling by in, you know, a car, uh, looking for violence. I, I can't imagine growing up around this shit or, or living around it now, just being immersed in it day in and day out like it's been in South Central. Constantly hearing shots and police sirens, constantly hearing about, you know, another funeral. The stress that would add to the normal stress of life seems unbearable. And sadly, so many people uh, don't have to imagine this scenario. Like going back to the large National Gang Center report, 49% of large cities experienced uh, significant gang problems before the 90s. 41.8% of suburban counties, 37.9% of smaller cities, 34% of rural counties. 32.4% of smaller cities uh, and 
4% of rural counties experienced gang problems after 2000 as well. Look hard enough, you can find gangs, you know, in a lot of places. And with gangs comes so much violence. From 2007 to 2012, there was an average of almost 2,000 gang-related homicides per year. For comparison, from 2007 to 2011, the FBI estimated over 15,500 homicides in the entire U.S. each year. It suggests that gang-related homicides made up 13% of all annual homicides, over 1 in 10, almost 3 in 20. And in L.A., Right, thanks to where all these drug uh, gangs got started, thanks to the crack epidemic, uh, you know, thanks to the bloody Bloods and Crips rivalry, the numbers much worse. L.A. County in 2012, 60 percent of all homicides were gang related. You know, there's uh, no no information in this report as far as like what neighborhoods they occurred in, but again, anecdotally, just doing some research, I- I'm going to say that 90 percent of those were in South Central, Compton, Inglewood, like those neighborhoods. Between 1985 and 2012, gangs. Uh, accounted for at least 20% of all L.A. County homicides, somewhere between one in five and three in five of murders every year. In both 1992 and 1995, over 800 people murdered in gang violence in a year. In 1989, in L.A. County, there were uh, 1,113 reported drive-by shootings, accounting for 1,675 people either being murdered or wounded in these shootings. And most of the men doing this killing, most of the men uh, getting killed, So fucking young. National Gang Report survey respondents provided age and demographic info on gang members in the U.S. In 1995, 50% of gang members under the age of 18. And how many of the other 50% over the age of 18 were under the age of 18 when they joined the gang? In 2011, 35% of gang members under the age of 18. Vast majority of these gang members, male. 1998, only 7.7% of gang members, female. By 2010, only 7.4% of gang members, female. Uh, Racially, 1996, 45.2% of U.S. gang members identified as Hispanic or Latino, 35.6% black or African-American, 11.6% white, 7.5% other. Those percentages stayed pretty steady year after year. And while now there are numerous Asian, Pacific Islander, Latino, Bloods and Crips sets, early on membership uh, in the Bloods and Crips gangs, almost exclusively black. And while no big global comparative study has been conducted, to my knowledge, it seems that America has a uh, a bigger problem total numbers-wise with street gangs than any other country in the world. Other nations like El Salvador have more gang members per capita, right? Uh, The nation of 6.5 million people has, by some estimates, up to 500,000 people with gang ties. Other estimates have the number below 100,000, though. LA, the gang capital of America, estimated to have over 120,000 gang members just inside the city limits right now. The majority in South Central. And possibly way more than that during the 80s and 90s. Can't find any stats for those uh, decades if they even exist. When it comes specifically to loosely organized street gangs, not warlords, not terrorist groups, South Central has seen more warfare, more gang violence than anywhere else in the modern world. And it can all be traced back to the Bloods and Crips. There are no stats on how much this violence can specifically be traced to these two groups, right, year after year. But, you know, look over a, a list of active gangs in South Central and surrounding neighborhoods between 1970 and the present and overall... There are more Bloods and Crips sets than, you know, there are groups of any other gangs, especially in the 80s and 90s before numerous Latin gangs grew in presence like uh, MS-13 and stuff. So why are people joining these street gangs? I've already touched on that, but I want to explain it further. According again to that NGC study and also and also just processing what I've watched in, in various documentaries about this week's subject, most people join gangs gradually, often starts with them just spending time with gang members. If they do join a gang, they may have a peripheral role initially, while others are more deeply involved in gangs. There are five categories of risk factors for joining a gang. Individual, family, school, peer, and neighborhood community. And I think the last one, neighborhood community, I think that's the biggest factor, right? Obviously, where you happen to grow up has a huge influence over whether or not you join a gang. I was never asked to join a gang, mostly because I didn't know anyone in a gang. I didn't live by anybody that I knew was in a gang. Really easy for me to not to get wrapped up in any of that shit. Real easy for anyone who never grew up around this shit. Anyone who grew up in a stable home with loving parents who checked in on you and held you accountable for your actions also to not get pulled into the gang life. And I can say as someone who did engage in a fair amount of criminality growing up, as someone whose dad and stepmom did not keep close tabs on me for a few years of high school, if I would have lived in a neighborhood surrounded by gangs doing the same shit I was doing, but at a higher level, and then those gangs offered me friendship, protection, girls hanging around who thought it was fucking hot for a dude to be in a gang, I would have for sure joined a gang when I was 15, 16 years old. Like, no fucking doubt. Especially if I'd previously, say, uh, got my ass beat. 
by other gang members. And, uh, you know, if after, if, if after I get jumped, some gang members offer me protection from those gang members who beat me and then a chance for revenge, would I have taken them up on it? Yeah, a hundred percent. I don't look down on any one of these gangs or who used to belong on one of these gangs for getting wrapped up in this shit. For some people, it, it honestly almost feels inevitable. Those without loving, watchful parents, growing up in poor neighborhoods, struggling, you know, uh, neighborhoods, growing up surrounded by gang members and violence. The one, the ones who do that and still never join, so much respect. I'm fucking amazed. I mean, imagine how easy it would be, especially if your dad is in the gang and your mom is affiliated somehow, and maybe your uncles are too, your brothers and your friends. Almost impossible to not join yourself. Probably feels like your destiny which is a word actually uh, uh, used by an unnamed gang member uh, in this Crips and Bloods Made in America documentary. Just felt it was his destiny. Everybody he knew was in the fucking gang, right? How the fuck would you not join? Uh, the Crips and Bloods Made in America documentary team spoke with three men named Ron, Bird, and Kumasi who grew up in South Central in the 1950s, and they provided more insight on why they became involved with gangs. Uh, you know, like how it all got started. Bird recalled how his mom took him to sign up for the Boy Scouts. Scoutmaster told him that some of the white parents were going to object to him being in the all-white troop. So he needed to be prepared for pushback and, uh, you know, inevitably they just, they didn't let him in. Kamasi said, we couldn't be Cub Scouts, couldn't be Boy Scouts, couldn't be Explorer Scouts. We couldn't get involved in organized activity that would take us anywhere that would bear us any kind of good fruit. So we built an auxiliary alternative. How fucked up. Not allowed to be in a positive youth group, right? Not, uh, so these kids, you know, who'd, 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 they'd all been shunned by these groups due to racism, they form their own group. They're hurt. They're angry. Of course, their uh, group wasn't going to turn into anything real positive. Other men provided their perspectives on why they joined gangs. I joined a gang not only for the protection, but for the love, for the unity, to be part of a family. That's so sad to me, right? To be part of a family nationwide for over uh, half a century now, at least, based on stats, two-thirds of black homes nationwide, single-parent homes. I, I can't, you know, isolate uh, the, the states for the, uh, or the stats, excuse me, for the area of just South Central during the 70s and 80s and 90s when the Bloods and Crips membership was surging. But due to the overall turmoil of the area, I would have to think that this number was at least two thirds, if not higher. It's uh, almost always the dad that leaves too, as opposed to the other way around. So many boys, young men being raised in homes without fathers, raised without grandfathers, looking for male role models, looking for family, for love, guidance. And uh, who are the men giving him that? Gang members, gang members not living in poverty because they're out there taking what they want. So I, I get the appeal. Again, it would be so hard not to join. Back to the men speaking in the doc about why they joined gangs. If you're living in an environment where you're being assaulted like I was, I just got tired of being a victim. It's like either you're the victim or you're the victor. Another guy said, I didn't get jumped into this. I grew up in this. My mom grew up in my neighborhood. My dad from my neighborhood, all my uncles from my neighborhood. So I don't look at it as no gang thing. It's just family, right? His whole family's in this gang. Now, the guy says when he's hooked up with his crew, they're feeding him, they're looking out for him, they're putting clothes on his back. Okay, but now it's time to get in his car and go get these people who just shot up my house. What are you going to do? You're obligated. That man just fed you all month. How can you say no to that? Fuck, how do you, how do you fight that? By cracking down harder and harder on crime, especially nonviolent crime. That's how America has reacted, but I think it's the wrong move. Mass incarceration, not a smart plan to clean up crime carried out largely due to a lack of hope, a lack of economic opportunity, lack of family infrastructure, right? Building out new infrastructure, creating quality jobs, creating hope. To me, that's the only way. Some incarceration, sure. But mass incarceration that puts a crazy amount of young men, uh, black men in prison, leaving more uh, black children to grow up without fathers in crime-ridden neighborhoods with little opportunities. That's a good recipe to create more and more crime in the long run, which is, you know, what's happened. And community activists and intellectuals, you know, who've been studying this shit, they've been saying this for years, but not enough people are listening. 2017, Vice interviewed several Crips members in New York City, other than JT, who I mentioned earlier, about why they chose to join a gang. One identified member said, the thing is, man, what can the government and these people do to stop this other than lock us up? Give us things to do. Community centers, programs, access to other things, instead of just taking us and shipping us up the river. If you don't give us something, a gateway, something... They're going to fall to negativity. Now it's where gang banging is about protecting around you. The real gang is the police. All this shit uh, makes me think again about vice, not the media company, but nonviolent behavior labeled immoral or wicked drug use, sex work, gambling. Why the fuck won't we get more serious about legalizing all of that? 
Our culture is so poisoned and brainwashed in some way, so stuck in the worst habits, doubling down on shit that has proven to not work decade after decade. Legalizing drugs would minimize gang violence far more than dumping money into militarizing law enforcement, right? Take away the money gangs can make. It's so fucking obvious when you look at the problem long enough. Incarceration, mass arrest, you're not dealing with the source of the wound. Your best case, slapping a little Band-Aid on a massive open wound. Or worst case, you know, when you're infecting the wound, you're making it so much worse. You're taking nonviolent offenders, putting them in violent prisons, then putting them back on the same streets where they were arrested with less opportunities than before they were sent to prison the first time. Now they're felons, harder to get a straight job, back in the same neighborhoods, around the same lack of opportunity, around the same old gang members. Of course they're going to go back to the same crime. Now, because they know how rough prison is, I imagine they're going to be a little more violent in their effort to not end back up in prison. Drug money is what leads to uh, most of the violence in street gangs. Drug money allows gangs to, to buy black market weapons that lead to so many murders, legalize drugs, and you attack gangs nonviolently in the most effective way possible. Pimping is another way gangs will make money. Also illegal gambling. Why not legalize all that shit? Put profits into practical education initiatives, not simple-minded, moralist bullshit like just say no to drugs. Just don't have sex. Abstinence. Fuck that corny feel good but doesn't do shit bullshit. I never fully, re- I, I never will fully respect our government or our society at large while, while this vice remains illegal. It's just a constant reminder of hypocrisy, of how foolish our society is at the highest level, right? Care more about political optics and doing what's right. And now I'll step off the soapbox uh, before I get stuck there. <laughs> I'll get back to the story, but just keep, keep running into the same fucking uh, sad solutions to problems that just don't work in so many of these episodes. All right, let's zero in a bit. Uh, Why South Central? Why is this the place where primarily black street gangs, gangs that went on to become the infamous Bloods and Crips, most infamously began to flourish in the early 1970s? Let's back up a few decades, try and figure that out. In the 1950s, the overwhelming majority of residents of South Central Los Angeles were black uh, due to years of legal discrimination. African-Americans had begun moving to LA in large numbers shortly after 1900. For the next 40 years, the numbers doubled every decade. By 1940, they represented slightly more than 4% of the total population. And right from the beginning, the city was segregated because of racially restrictive housing covenants written into property deeds. These covenants were not only enforced through property deeds, banks and insurance companies also enforced them through the practices of consistently denying loans, insurance policies, and other financial services for any African-Americans who attempted to sidestep these covenants. This practice known as redlining happened all over the nation and continued around L.A. long after the covenants were declared unconstitutional in 1948. During World War II, when there was a shortage of workers, the federal government made it illegal for employers to discriminate based on a candidate's race. So I guess, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah, I did back, sorry, I had 1948 in my head. I'm like, wait a minute, that's after World War II, but that's not what we're, that was about the other thing. Uh, That legislation was taken more serious than the covenants, and it led to a lot of new jobs, good jobs for black Americans in the L.A. area. After World War II, L.A. became a major center for the automotive industry. Companies like GM, Chrysler, Ford, Goodyear, Firestone, they built factories in South LA. A lot of of local black men and a few women now had comparatively high-paying jobs. They were able to afford nice housing, education for themselves, able to send their kids to college. This was all new. An attitude of a a new kind of hope was in the air, right? New kind of hope for a better future began to take root. The neighborhoods had black doctors, black lawyers, black executives, business owners, black Americans moving to LA for these new job opportunities in industrial and technological fields. Uh, you know, they're doing, they're moving in mass. Over 4 million African-Americans left the South and moved to major cities like New York, Chicago, and LA in the, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Between 1942 and 1945, some 340,000 blacks settled in California alone, 200,000 of whom migrated to LA, and all 200,000 forced to live in the segregated area that would become known as South Central. Subsequent overcrowding in South Central caused the housing crisis to become the number one issue facing Los Angeles' black community at that time. And the greater the black population grew, the more tightly enforced uh, the restricting housing covenants were. Right? Though the black community doubled in size in the 1940s, it remained confined to pre-war boundaries. In this period known as the uh, Great Migration, also the heyday of Central Avenue uh, as a jazz district called West Coast Harlem, all right, a bit of a renaissance, numerous restaurants, music venues, nightclubs like the Lincoln Theater, Club Alabama, stretched from Pico to Slauson from the 1920s to the early 60s. I talked about a lot of this in Time Suck episode 209, the American riots, right, the 1992 riots, and so much more. Uh, important to hit these historical notes again here. 
The Dunbar Hotel at 43rd and Central was where jazz luminaries like Billie Holiday, Duke Ellington, Ella Fitzgerald, Lester Young would stay when they visited L.A. Hollywood's biggest celebrities like Marilyn Monroe, Rita Hayworth, Orson Welles, they would regularly visit the avenue. But despite this story, musical and cultural history, the lack of housing overcrowding made for poor living conditions for the people actually fucking living there. Graduate the 1950s, the southern section of L.A. from Watts and, uh, and west towards Inglewood and the Crenshaw District became increasingly African-American. West Adams, uh, Limerick Park, Baldwin Hills, gradually became middle class, upper middle class, African-American uh, areas. Black Americans living in the neighborhoods uh, earned enough money to qualify as middle class, purchase real estate, and according to the Bloods and Crips documentary, to establish, if not exactly, a very close similarity to the American dream. As the 1950s gave way to the early 1960s, neighborhoods were desegregated. Several of the leading black churches were beginning to wield political influence and civic affairs, and some people didn't like that. And one of those people who liked it the least was LAPD police chief William Parker, who held that position from 1950 to 1966. And history has not been kind to Chief Parker because he was a cunt. He was a huge piece of shit. He became infamous uh, for bullying black and brown citizens uh, into their part of town. He would make statements complaining about black people uh, moving to L.A. from the South all the time, just publicly. After the Watts riots in 1965, he compared black people participating in the riots to monkeys in a zoo, just publicly. Uh, during the riots, made the public statement, it is estimated that by 1970, 45% of the metropolitan area of Los Angeles will be Negro. If you want any protection for your home and family, you're going to have to get in and support a strong police department. If you don't, come 1970, God help you. Holy fuck. Think about how over the top racist that is. And this dude is the police chief for a long time, setting the tone for the rest of LA's law enforcement. If he felt comfortable saying that in public, what was he saying in private? What was he doing to combat racism in his department? Fucking nothing. He was encouraging it, obviously. Publicly labeling black Americans just in general as the enemy. After the riots, he sent in an army to beat him down. Before the riots, Chief Parker uh, started a proactive, as he called it, policing approach. Instead of waiting for calls, officers, you know, would just go out on patrol and just, uh, you know, look for people committing crimes, look for black people committing crimes or, uh, you know, just black people just being black in a part of town they didn't want them to be in. Uh, many of these so-called criminals just so happen to be young black men. Uh, many saw the uh, actions of the LAPD here as blatant racial profiling, especially targeting young black men who refused to stay in the neighborhoods they were supposed to stay in. For a young black man, uh, just walking around Brentwood, Beverly Hills, Santa Monica, that was a crime at this time. Rumors abounded of police planting evidence left and right on any African-Americans who, uh, you know, didn't abide by these unwritten laws. So backing up just a bit, starting in the late 1950s, America's economy, especially in the L.A. area, shifts to highly skilled fields and, uh, and also low-skilled service jobs, kind of away from that middle ground where the auto industry existed. The aerospace industry replaces auto, auto manufacturing. Companies like GM, Chrysler, Ford, Goodyear, Firestone, they leave. And they take, uh, you know, the good jobs that the black community depended on in South Central with them. Black Americans, through segregation, through a lack of comparative socioeconomic opportunities, have been denied the type of education they would need to thrive in the emerging tech field of the aerospace industry. Factory workers now suddenly jobless at the same time that uber racist Chief Parker is cracking down on crime in ways that are overtly abusive and based in racial profiling. The LAPD's new policing practices, combined with the shift to the economy, Combined with overcrowded black neighborhoods and no tolerance for local black residents to move the fuck out of these neighborhoods, this sets the stage for the street gangs of the 60s and 70s. Black youth and struggling families denied entry to positive youth groups like the Boy Scouts and Cub Scouts, as I mentioned, living in neighborhoods with more poverty, poverty, which always leads to more crime. They start to join up in groups, often called street front fraternities in their neighborhoods, partially for protection, partially because no one else fucking wanted them and they wanted to belong to something something to make them feel proud, make them feel strong. And they're fucking angry. And anger, especially in young men who feel hopeless, so often leads to violence. Bird from the Bloods and Crips documentary said that in his neighborhood, his gang originated in Slauson Park, which is how his group got their name, the Slaussons. Slaussons, one of the uh, early gangs that would go on to become first the Crips, then the Bloods, as they kind of like split and mutate. According to Kamasi in that same documentary, they never called themselves a gang. Please gave him that label. Right, called themselves a club. Ron said that joining the Slossons gave him a feeling of identity and family that he didn't get anywhere else. There was also a sense of power and numbers for someone who felt powerless. 
Uh, there were rivalries among the Slossons, other groups. They fought on the sidewalks, alleys, parks. Kumasi said these fights were more just for competition. Machismo. Not doing serious violence. Not killing anyone. They were fist fights, right? No weapons. Police are frequently stopping and questioning these young black men. Uh, Dr. Todd Boyd, University of Southern California professor, told the producers, the cops were treating these young black men as though they were enemies, as though they were in warfare. There was no community outreach going on. No innocent until proven guilty. No, hey, how you doing, guys? Just uh, immediately assuming they were up to no good. You know, of course they were. They were black and black people were the fucking enemy, just as their boss told them. Dr. Josh Sides, former history professor, chair of the history department at Cal State Northridge, added it was an open secret that one of the tacit duties of the LAPD was to make sure people were in their right neighborhoods at the right time. And Alameda Boulevard was the white curtain of L.A. Don't cross it. When black men and women crossed that invisible line, they were stopped, questioned, often arrested. Right. This treatment made them feel alienated, powerless and angry. Kumasi said in a free society, I'm walking down the street. Police got the nerve to ask me, where are you going? Where are you coming from? Ain't none of your damn business where I'm going. And ain't none of your damn business where I came from. The fuck you talking about? Where are you going? He going to ask me, what are you doing here? You go anywhere and ask anybody else what they're doing here. Do you stop and ask anybody else in this society, man? Why do you exist? You understand what I'm saying? But you got the nerve to ask me that all day, every day. Now, what do you think that does to me psychologically? What does that tell me? What message am I being fed every day? See, he don't understand that every day he's feeding me a spoonful of hatred. Every day, that's my diet, a spoonful of hatred, you see? And it's just a question of when is this going to erupt and upon whom is it going to erupt? Am I going to attack myself? Am I going to attack my brother? You understand? Am I going to attack my own image in the mirror? Or am I going to eventually attack the cause of my anger and my frustration? That kind of policing is what led to the, uh, the Watts riots. The Watts Rebellion or the Watts Riots, series of riots that started on August 11th, 1965 in the Watts neighborhood of LA. Lasted until August 17th. 34 people died, over 1,000 injured, uh, 4,000 people arrested, roughly. Approximately 34,000 people involved in the riots in total about 1,000 buildings damaged. Costed around uh, $40 million. And how did it start? 7 p.m., August 11th, stepbrothers Marquette, Ronald Fry, pulled over by a white highway patrol officer, driving their mom's car near the corner of Avalon Boulevard and 116th Street in Watts. Marquette fails a sobriety test. Uh, there was uh, rumors that he was not uh, drunk at all, that it was, uh, you know, he should have passed, but the officer said he failed. He starts to panic as he's being arrested. He and one of the police officers get into a fight. Ronald Fry joins the fight. Crowd gathers around him. The backup officers that arrived assume the crowd was hostile. One of the crowd members gets into a fight with the police officer, right? Shit starts to get crazy. Another officer hits Ronald Fry in the stomach with his baton. Same officer then gets involved in the fight between Marquette and another officer. Marquette's hit with the baton, handcuffed, taken to one of the cars. By this point, Rena Fry, Ronald and Marquette's mom, arrives at the scene. She thinks the police officers are abusing her son, attempts to pull one of the officers off of him, leads to another fight. She's arrested. Ronald's arrested. Crowd's getting angry. Highway patrol officers using batons and shotguns to back the crowd away from the police car. Hundreds of people now show up at the scene. Then someone spits on a motorcycle police officer as he attempts to leave the scene. Two motorcycle police officers attempt to chase after the woman they thought spit on him. The crowd surrounds him. More police officers show up. A woman named Joyce Ann Gaines is arrested for spitting at the officers. She resists arrest, is about to be, uh, or has to be dragged away. She believes she was pregnant at the time. It becomes, you know, more angry at how she's being treated. By 7.45 p.m., the situation escalated into a full riot. Crowd members are throwing rocks, bottles, other objects at the buses and cars that are stuck in traffic. Crowd begins attacking drivers, hitting them with rocks and bricks, pulling them out of their cars. In the morning, watch community leaders from churches, local governments, and the NAACP have a meeting to attempt to calm down the rioting. Rena Fry attends a meeting, asks people to stop rioting. People use this meeting to voice their complaints about the police and local government. After Rena makes her statement, a teenager takes the microphone, announces that the rioters are going to be moving into predominantly white areas of L.A. People freak the fuck out. Watts community leaders request for the LAPD to send in more black police officers to respond to the riot there. But Chief fucking Klan Grand Dragon Parker uh, declines that request, plans to call in the National Guard. This and the teen's impromptu announcement escalate the riot significantly. Now even more people are involved in the rioting, right? This night, police are uh, fucking fighting with uh, various citizens. Uh, there's vandalized, you know, tons of vandalization going on. I think that's a word. A lot of things are being vandalized. Uh, stores are being looted. The crowd also attacks firefighters who are attempting to put out some of the fires. It's fucking madness. By the end of the day, 50 square miles of LA are in chaos. 14,000 National Guard members are sent in, right? They treat residents like uh, uh, an enemy army. 
People are now shooting the police, National Guard, creating Molotov cocktails. National Guard erects barricades, threatens to shoot anyone who crosses them. It's a war zone. White versus black, white cops, white National Guard, black residents. And then Chief Parker says the super inflammatory racist shit I said earlier. According to the LA Times, black and Hispanic communities were outraged by Parker's comments, especially because they'd echoed similar comments he'd been making for years. Riots continue on for three more days. On the final day of the riot, the police surround a local mosque, fire guns on unarmed residents, arrest people inside, some of whom, some of whom had nothing to do with the, the rioting. They were just fucking hiding out of fear. Also raid a building next door, even spray tear gas down into the sewers to prevent people inside from escaping. There's two fires. The mosque is destroyed. Most of the 34 people who died are black. Two police officers and a firefighter also die. 26 deaths are ruled justifiable homicides, but a lot of people living there did not see it that way at all. After the Watts riot, Governor Edmund G. Brown appoints John McCone to lead a commission to investigate the cause of the riot and recommend preventative measures for the future. McCone was a former director of the CIA. A commission identified the causes of the riots and made suggestions for community programs to improve schools, provide new jobs, better housing, better health care, improve the community's relationship with the police department, right? Because that's what the fucking problems were. That's why this shit all got started. The city does not follow the commission's advice at all. Little to no improvements are made, right? And this is read, this lack of action, and this is read rightfully so by the black community of South Central LA as you do not fucking matter. All that hope in the 40s and early 50s, the city government, you know, uh, you know, to take a shit on all that, then set that shit on fire, then fucking rubbed it in people's faces. So many civic leaders, so so short-sighted back then, So many still so short-sighted with this kind of stuff. Uh, After the Watts riots in 1965, many young black people become more active in their communities. They're joining community service organizations. They're joining groups like the Black Panthers. But by the late 60s, many civil rights activists and Black Panthers were fucking dead, assassinated, or put in prison. Fred Hampton, leader for the Black Panther Party in Chicago, murdered in his apartment during a police raid while sleeping, unarmed. In 1968, Martin Luther King murdered, right, assassinated in Memphis. 1968, Malcolm X murdered in Manhattan. 1965, Sammy Young Jr., civil rights activist, killed in Alabama. 1966, and on and on and on. This is devastating to many in the black community. On top of everything else that had been happening, now it's like their fucking hearts have been ripped out. The lack of leadership leaves a void, and that void is filled by gangs. Kamasi said the original Crips came out of our neighborhood. They were the children we passed by every day and paid no attention to, but they watched us. We had the generation our parents came from, and we had the great personalities of their generation to connect with. We had something to attach ourselves to, as in these leaders. They didn't. Uh, journalist Elizabeth Collins wrote a, uh, a 2022 Grunge article that says, in the 1960s, South Central, two things were happening. Young men were coming of age in low-income project housing, initially designed to house factory workers and the civil rights movement. The Black Panther Party, created after the Watts riots, 1965, gave older gang members a focus on fighting police brutality. All the while, younger men and teenagers are forming gangs and engaging in crime. Now the real beginning of the Bloods and Crips gets going. The California Office of Justice published Crips and Bloods Street Gangs, Volume 4, in 1991, intended to aid California law enforcement in identifying gang members. According to this report, There have been gangs in Los Angeles since the 20s, mostly in Compton and South Central. These gangs came about because of young people coming together to protect themselves from other youth gangs in neighborhoods. These gangs defended their territories from other gangs. They got into fights often, but there were much fewer stabbings, shootings than in modern times. Almost none. You know, it was almost all fist fights. Wasn't about drugs, gambling, or pimping. It was young dudes proving how tough they were to other young dudes for the most part. But then the Crips were founded decades later in 1969 by some high schoolers after all the stuff that we just went over. Some say the Crips picked blue because it was one of the colors of Washington High School in South Central where early members supposedly went. Uh, Blood soon formed uh, to protect themselves from the Crips, formed in response to the Crips. Uh, The Crips were known as a violent and dangerous street gang when the Bloods formed. First Bloods came from Piru Street in Compton. They named themselves the Compton Pyrus. They wore the color red because most of the members attended Centennial High School in Compton and red was one of their school colors. All right, now that the stage has been set, let's dig deeper into the origins of the Bloods and Crips rivalry. Love digging into all this history, by the way. It was a challenge this week, but when I felt like I finally understood it all, the basics, felt like putting the last few pieces of a, a really complicated jigsaw puzzle together. Just a ha! So that's how all this shit got started. Hell, fucking Nimrod. Love learning me something new. Uh, love gaining a little more of an educated perspective on something, especially on something that provides me with a little more empathy for the struggles of other meat sacks. Gains me a 
little more gratitude for how I've been uh, fortunate in many ways, not, ha- not to have to deal with this shit. I uh, hope this gives many of you the same feelings. All right, now time for the Time Suck timeline. Right after today's sponsor break. Thanks for listening once again, dearest Meat Sacks. Now off the origins of the infamous Bloods Crips rivalry we go. Strap on those boots, soldier. We're marching down a time suck timeline. Original Crips founder Raymond Washington was born in South Central August 14th, 1953, probably. Uh, that's what most sources list. Journalist Michael Krikorian, a writer from Gardenia, California, who has covered the history of the Bloods and Crips and uh, other South Central gangs extensively, writes that Raymond Washington was actually born in Texas. But then his family moved to L.A. shortly after his birth, and then he grew up on 76th Street near Wadsworth Avenue. So Texas, L.A., but, you know, uh, probably L.A. And then uh, you know, when he was a baby, either way, he's in L.A. He grew up less than three miles from the campus of USC, a prestigious private university that when you factor in room and board, Costs a little over $80,000 a year, right? No big whoops. Tuition alone, just over 60000 pocket change. Uh, what, what a great affordable institution providing quality education to both princes and paupers. Uh, some of the school's many, many famous alumni include George Lucas, creator of Star Wars and Indiana Jones franchises, legendary Western actor John Wayne, uh, astronaut and first man to definitely step on the moon because that shit was not fake, Neil Armstrong. Director John Singleton graduated from USC. Then just a year later, made Boys in the Hood, a gritty, critically acclaimed film released in 1991 about growing up amongst the violence we'll be talking about today in South Central L.A., a movie that was my introduction to the subject, a film that introduced me to Ice Cube. Dan, that's a talented man. I listened to nothing but West Coast gangster rap from the 90s to get the right vibe going in the background while I polished these notes last few days. Uh, N.W.A., Easy e Bloods and Crips, Banging on Wax, Volumes 1 and 2, and a lot of Ice Cube. Forgot how incredible his first few albums are. How raw, real, passionate, crazy listening to him talk about a lot of this uh, gang stuff. Stuff I heard him talk about when I was a teen and just thought, oh, cool, fuck you, sweet. Uh, like I might want to go live in Compton. Doesn't sound cool now. Makes me sad for the kids who did live through it. Kids who never asked to be born into all that bullshit. Anyway, USC, so many famous directors, actors, artists, etc. have attended that college. And I doubt many of them ever venture just three or so miles south to where Raymond grew up in a different fucking world, right? Just crazy. Raymond grew up just a few miles, not just from USC, but from Beverly Hills, Hollywood, Malibu, so much more places where dreams are made, places featuring some of the most sought after real estate in the world, definitely in the US, places that could uh, not feel more different than South Central. Where he grew up, it might as well have been just on the other side of the planet, on the other side of the moon. Uh, Raymond's parents were Violet Samuel and Reginald Washington. Ray also had three older brothers from his mom's first marriage and a half-brother from her second marriage. Violet, Ray's mom, told Michael Krikorian, uh, that journalist, Raymond was a good kid when he was a boy. Raymond didn't go out of his way to fight or do anything bad, but if someone came to him, he would protect himself. And he was well-built. He tried to protect uh, protect the community, keep the bad guys out, but after a while, every time I looked up, the police were coming to the house looking for Raymond. Raymond, a mysterious figure. Uh, Known as a protector of the community, but also some saw him as a bully. Lori Griffin Moss, a woman who grew up right across the street from Washington, said, I don't have a whole lot of good to say about Raymond. Raymond was a bully, a muscular bully. He wouldn't let anybody from outside our neighborhood bother us. He would bother us. Raymond could be very mean. LA Times reported that the people who grew up with him knew him as a legendary street fighter. Uh, That's a quote. And this guy apparently could fucking brawl like nobody. Uh, Raymond's brother, Gerard Barton, told Krikorian he was real, real good with his hands. He could bring it from his shoulders. Like Mike Tyson in his prime. He weighed about 215 pounds, all muscle. I never saw my brother lose a fight. Except to my older brothers when he was real young. But then when he got a little older, he could even take them. Raymond was also a good football player, but he had no interest in organized sports. Uh, Ray hated people who brought guns to fights, called them punks. He mainly got into fights for two reasons, to protect people in his neighborhood or to fight people in his neighborhood. Dude fought a lot. He was kicked out of every school he ever attended for fighting. He was sent to different juvenile detention camps uh, for months at a time for fighting. And then would fight more when he got back home. Hearing all the stories about him getting in constant fist fights, when I looked him up online, I expected to see a picture of a dude who looked fucking mean, maybe missing a few teeth, right? Scars all over his face from all these fights, evil glint in his eye, maybe some kind of bodybuilder, bar bouncer physique. Look of a predator? No. 
No, dude was built like a muscular NFL wide receiver. Strong, but like slender. I think for, you know, for today's guys. And then uh, he had a face. If you didn't know who he was, what he was capable of, I feel like he has a very kind face. Looked like a nice dude, handsome. Looks like a cool guy you'd want to be friends with. Not a dude that you would fear. In the late 60s, uh, Ray, just a teenager, started studying the teachings of the Black Panthers. Admired how they were trying to change their communities. Admired how they didn't act subservient towards whites who despised them. Admired their toughness, their militantness. Right? They weren't going to take any uh, unjust bullshit. They didn't give a fuck about bending the knee to a system that never had shown them any justice. So Ray wanted to do the same thing that they did just in his way. Crips co-founder Stanley Tookie Williams, or Tookie. He was also born in 1953. Uh, Tookie, uh, not a nickname, as I always thought it was. It's actually his middle name. Same middle name as his dad, according to uh, what he'd say in an interview. Uh, Tookie was born uh, December 29th of uh, 1953. Yeah, New Orleans, Louisiana, or maybe Shreveport. More than half of the sources say New Orleans. The rest say Shreveport. All say Louisiana. Uh, his mom, known in sources as Louis- Louisiana Williams, not sure if that was her birth name or nickname, uh, just 17 years old when she had him. And after the first year of his life, when his dad, who's never mentioned uh, by name, uh, left, she raised him alone. In 1959, never mind like his, his full name. Never, never, uh, 1959, when he was five, Stanley and his mom moved to LA for a chance at a better life. At just six years old, Stanley, classic latchkey kid, Starts wandering around on the street because he said it was more interesting than being at home. Clearly, mom not keeping a real close eye on him, which uh, she might not have been able to. Not judging. May not have been her fault at all. Sources don't say, but, uh, you know, she might not have had time to watch young Stanley because she's busy fucking working. Make sure that food was on the table. Make sure the lights uh, were staying on. Dad's not sticking around. No other family are around to help out. If you're living in an area with little to no social programs to help you, well, what the fuck are you supposed to do? Uh, young Tukey learned how to fight real early in order to defend himself from bullies. He would later say, as a member of the black male species, living in the ghetto uh, ghetto microcosm, circumstances dictated that I either be prey or predator. It didn't require deep reflection to determine which of the two I preferred. Well stated. And he was a, a very good writer. I mean, uh, who would prefer to be the prey if prey or predator are your only options? I mean, I would take predator every day. Uh, Tuki idolized the older criminals he often saw around the neighborhood, spent time with. As a young teen, he got a job working for some of them, feeding, treating the dogs, the uh, feeding and treating dogs that were injured during their illegal dog fights. The dogs that he cared for when they weren't fighting other dogs to the death, they were being beaten by gamblers and hustlers, as he would say, beaten by the same guys who shot him when their injuries were too severe to fight again. Well, Django just growled, snarled, and left the suck dungeon to go uh, shake off some of his rage. Maybe he chased his cat or squirrel or something. Hope he doesn't catch him. Uh, what is, what is seeing that done to dogs going to do to your psychology growing up? What's that going to do to a developing mind being exposed to that level of callousness and cruelty? Most little kids raised to see dogs as loving companions, a source of solace when the world of humans isn't being particularly kind to you. Most kids uh, grow up spoiling their dogs, showing love to the creatures that unconditionally love them back. Dogs are a great way to teach a kid compassion, empathy, to show kindness to creatures that depend on you to survive. Instead, uh, Tuki is taught that it's okay to beat and kill them that their lives are disposable. And then to make his heart even harder, the gangsters he admired teach him to treat other kids like they treated those dogs. All right, the men around him eventually shift from betting on dog fights to betting on fights between boys. So he was paid to box other little kids in his neighborhood, paid to fucking beat the shit out of them. Violence is all around him from the beginning of his life, right? Uh, mastering violence is what his uh, mentors admire. What they don't care about is education. And Tukey struggles in school when he goes, which is, you know, not often. Also, like Raymond Washington, he gains a reputation, not surprisingly, uh, amongst the kids he sometimes does go to school with for being a real good fucking fighter. Makes a name for himself as a young dude not to be trifled with. A dude real good at delivering beatdowns. Like Washington, he's a, he's a true alpha male. Lesser alpha males flock to him and he becomes the leader of their little crew. Guys who ran with Tukey felt like they won the brawl before they even showed up to the fight. Right? Stanley and his friends making money, uh, stealing, shining shoes, mostly by stealing. Unlike Ray, uh, Tuki uh, looked like a dude who delivered a lot of beatdowns. Holy shit. This is a big, muscular motherfucker. Uh, later, once he, uh, you know, had lifted for some years in prison, this guy at 5'10 would weigh 300 pounds and a lean 300 pounds at 5'10, which is absurd. He, um, he honestly reminds me, when you look at pictures of him posing, he reminds me of the He-Man action figures I had as a kid, like come to life. Like cartoonishly big muscles, just jacked gigantic arms and chest. Like, like if you didn't know anything about Raymond Washington or Tookie Williams, no one in their right mind based on their looks would ever prefer to fight Tookie. You'd be like, I'll fucking, I'll take Ray. Even though he might've been the better fighter. Uh, 1971, Washington Williams, both 17, 
come together to form the Crips. Maybe. Many sources say that they uh, formed in 1969 at Washington High School when uh, they were 15. But according to uh, Tukey, Raymond never even attended Washington High School. So there's, you know, discrepancies in a lot of the sources. Somewhere between 1969 and 1971 is where this all got started. Begun by two kids that, while maybe not enrolled in this high school, were uh, high school age. Why was the gang formed? Supposedly in an effort to protect their neighborhoods from other rival gangs. And the Crips wasn't the first gang that either man was in. In the late 60s, uh, Ray had joined the Avenues gang, led by a man named Craig Munson. So random. But Craig also was a fucking gigantic dude. Also way into bodybuilding. Actually became a professional bodybuilder. Clearly when some of these dudes weren't getting into brawls, man, they were fucking prepping for those brawls. Doing a lot of lifting. Uh, Craig and Tukey too, they both went on to uh, work out sometimes at the famous Gold's Gym in Venice Beach. Right, the mecca for bodybuilders, especially during the golden age of bodybuilding. Lou Ferrigno, Franco Colombo, Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is where all these uh, big dudes, you know, lifted uh, during the 70s and 80s. And South Central's Craig Munson was one of the strongest dudes in that whole gym. (laughs) Tyler and I were talking about this this morning, just how mind-blowing this is. He could bench 500 pounds for 10 reps, like a set of 10. That That is ridiculous. He could do overhead tricep extensions, fringe curls, with 225 pounds. It's hard to mentally... Pr- I've lifted for years. Benching 315 once will get a look of like, oh, okay, that dude's strong. Like at most gyms. Repping 225 is like, all right, okay, he's a, you know, he's a serious lifter. Just fucking tossing that above your head, just bouncing around 500 pounds like it's a warm-up weight. I've never seen anything like that in real life, just in videos. Anyway, this dude took first place in some international bodybuilding competitions. Uh, if there would have been more powerlifting stuff that he would have been to, probably would have destroyed it. Uh, but his gangbanging did keep him uh, from uh, achieving the same level of popularity as a lot of his peers. He was actually known as the gangster bodybuilder. So I knew that I know that, that was not pertinent info. A little side road that I just, uh, I'm fascinated by. I've been into bodybuilding, world's strongest man type competitions forever. Anyway, Ray got into a fight with, uh, you know, fucking He-Man's brother. Uh, chose to leave Hercules' gang and start his own gang called the Baby Avenues. So he goes from the Avenues to the Baby Avenues. According to the website Black Past, which is a great source of information about a lot of stuff in South Central, the youthful aspect of the gang's membership then led to their adopting the name uh, of the Avenue Cribs, which then finally became the Crips. Uh, According to a National Geographic documentary I watched called National Geographic Investigates, Bloods and Crips, LA gangs, the rise of two street gangs. Uh, the Crips started off as the Cribs because the 10 or so kids who were its initial members, yeah, were very young, right? 14, 15 year olds. The Avenue Cribs become just the Cribs. Then the term Crib evolves to Crip early in the 70s when, and I fucking love this so much, imitating the look of pimps and black black exploitation films of that era, gang members started carrying canes that they would t- <laughs> use in some of these brawls, beating people with canes and walking with a pimp limp. Uh, some assault victims described their attackers as cripples. And then that was soon shortened to Crips. Love historical trivia like that. Hail Nimrod. And uh, so does somebody else. It's, uh, it's Chicken Joe. Haven't heard from him in forever. Bok bok, playboy. Bok bok. Crippin came from pimping. You can hear it in the way crabs talk. Watching OG Crip walk. Feet never coming off the sidewalk. The pimp game's all about working the street, making sure everybody knows you can run that stretch of concrete. Crip life was never about only making money and going to war. It's about looking good and fly when you're getting hardcore. Pimp style is about having that presence when you walk into the room. Make a heads turn and command respect for anyone who doesn't want to end up in a tomb. Pimps and Crips know that if they keep the gangster lean, nice and tight, everything's going to see all right. Now get back to your story because this history needs more relaying. You feel me? You dig? You hear what I'm saying? Oh shit! Love knowing that uh, Chicken Joe's still around. Dropping a bit of pimp, dropping a bit of pimp knowledge from time to time. Glad he wants me to uh, share this story. Uh, there are actually multiple theories on how the name Crips came to be. It's not for sure that one. I want it to be that one. I think it's probably that one. Most sources go with the one I just relayed, but there are other variations. Uh, there's one that's the the one I hope is not true. They just Crips is just a mispronunciation of Cribs that's stuck. Uh, another one's a combination of Cribs and R.I.P. Right, symbolizing members who were involved in the gang from birth to death. That one's, you know, pretty hardcore. Uh, some people close to Raymond Washington reported that the name came from a time when his older brother injured his ankle, walk with a limp. According to Ray's uh, younger brother, Gerard Barton, my older brother, Reggie, was kind of bow-legged. And then he twisted his ankle bad one time and he was walking with a limp. So he put Crip on his Chuck Taylor Converse All-Stars and Raymond took the name for his gang. 
All right, so maybe some other people claim that CRIPA, an acronym for Community Revolution in Progress. Tookie Williams wrote in his memoir to set the record straight about the Crips and the uh, gang's origins. According to him, uh, he and Raymond uh, led two groups of high school boys who liked to fight, joined together against other South Central uh, gangs who were harassing them. They called themselves Cribs, one of several name choices. They originally picked uh, names like uh, Black Overlords and Snoopies. Black Overlords, fucking way cooler than Snoopies. Overlord. That's a fucking sick gang name. Uh, Cribs turned into Crips during about a drunken revelry, he said, when the newly minted homeboys repeatedly mispronounced the B as a P. Uh, Williams wrote in his book that it is uh, false that the Crips came from the Black Panthers and that the name means Community Resource Inner City Project. Okay, well, I want to I want to believe that it came from early members fucking beating people with canes. Pimp walking. Uh, anyway, according to Crip lore, one day in the spring of either 1969 or 1971, more, most sources, again, do say 1969, took you Williams on his lunch break at Washington High School. Leaves to meet up with a friend, sees two strangers approach him. One of them calls out, hey, Tookie, steps in front of him. He asks, are you Tookie? Tookie assumed that they were there to fight, but then one of these guys smiles, holds out his hand, introduces himself as Raymond Washington. Ray tells Tookie that a mutual friend of theirs told him about Tookie's willingness to fight with neighboring gangs that were hassling him and his crew, how he'd had success fighting them, Ray said he was having, uh, you know, same problems for posing alliance together so that together they could show all of these other gangs who the baddest dudes in the hood really were. Stanley told him that he would think about it. And then he uh, later wrote in his memoir, we shook hands and I stood there watching as they disappeared around the corner of the, gym- of the gymnasium. An alliance was possible, I felt, because it aligned with my agenda to consolidate the groups of homeboys I'd met over the years. I envisioned our being not a gang in the customary sense, but an unstoppable force that no gang in Los Angeles or the world could ever defeat. The thought appealed to my growing megalomania. I made up my mind right there that the alliance was on. The original Crips were founded by approximately 30 high schoolers who quickly divided into the East and West. Ray was in charge of the East, uh, you know, East South Central. Tookie was in charge of uh, the West South Central group. Tookie later wrote, when Raymond and I became joint leaders of the Cribs, we functioned as a single federation. But during that period, when our name, the Cribs, mutated into the Crips, tribalism began to develop. The two organizations were autonomous and were allies with the same agenda, war against street gangs. Each side engaged in a competitive aggression to see which could conquer the most other gangs or take the most leather coats, cars, jewelry, or money from those gangs. In spite of all the inflated egos, there was no tribal Crip warfare between the West and the East, not even fistfights. The occasional verbal conflicts between homeboys were always settled in full-contact football games held on Saturdays at St. Andrews Park. It was a magnificent scene, a collection of black talent on the field, although none of them would ever be offered an athletic scholarship or even an education. Uh, sucks about the education and scholarships, obviously. Uh, something uh, weirdly um, innocent, for lack of a better term, about the early years of the Crips. All right, at this point, these guys aren't dealing drugs, aren't killing other gang members in fights over drug turf. They're not uh, pimping. They're not running around providing protection uh, for underground gambling. They're not extorting anyone for protection. They're not running drive-bys where a lot of innocent people are getting killed. There's young dudes, from what it sounds like, uh, you know, from what a lot of people who were there in the early years and a few docs I watched would say, who mostly just wanted to be part of a group, a group of tough guys, you know, protection from other tough guys, camaraderie. A lot of male ego shit. Prove your gang was the toughest group of dudes in the hood. Prove that you were one of the toughest or the toughest motherfucker in the hood. But it wasn't guns at this point. It's about fighting with your fists, generally in big rumbles that would break out at parties, nightclubs, predetermined fight locations like a like a park, a parking lot, whatever. The worst thing you had to fear weapon-wise these rumbles in the early days was uh, getting hit with a bicycle chain or a baseball bat. And even that sounds rare. Mostly it was guys throwing fists, not beating random citizens, beating on other gang members. To prove that their gang was tougher. Prove that no one could come into their neighborhood and fuck with them. After his union with Tookie, uh, Ray expands his uh, influence by challenging other gang leaders to fights. Still fist fights. After he will, uh, you know, win the fight. And it doesn't sound like he ever, literally ever lost. According to lore, he always won. Maybe that's the myth building. Uh, he would then invite the beaten gang members to join his gang, the Crips. But they chose not to. He'd warn them there was going to be more beatings in the future. Former gang member Gerard Barton told Michael Krikorian he would go to the leader of another gang and fight him. He went straight to their main man. Once he put that guy on his back, everyone else would join up and follow him. This guy's a legend. Uh, March 20th, 1972, the violence finally escalates uh, beyond beatdowns. That night, Curtis Mayfield has a concert performing with the uh, Chicago dance show Soul Train at the Hollywood Palladium. Just outside the concert, some Crips members murder a 16-year-old kid named Robert uh, Bayou Jr., when he refused to hand over a leather jacket, his leather jacket, 
According to an LA Times article, he was stomped and beaten to death. Witnesses reported that Robert and his four friends were attacked by about 20 people. Nine people were arrested, most of them students at Washington High School. This is the first publicly confirmed incident of the Crips murdering anyone. In response to this attack and a lot of other beatdowns that had happened over the past few years, various South Central rival gangs will soon join together to defend themselves against the Crips. Journalist Krikorian uh, wrote, in the way that the killing of Archduke Franz Ferdinand of Austria sparked World War I, the war between the Crips and Bloods was ignited by the killing of Robert Bayou Jr. Here's a few more details about the attack that led to a decades-long gang war that has claimed thousands and thousands of lives. Uh, by one account, back in 2009, some 15,000 people have been uh, murdered in Bloods and Crips-related violence. Uh, for comparison, to show how crazy this is, in the Troubles, right, the heart of the IRA conflict, taking place mostly in Northern Ireland, roughly 3,500 people murdered in roughly the same amount of time between the 1960s and 1998. Bloods and Crips conflict has been way more violent than the Irish Republican Army violence, which has received far more press. Uh, back to this first murder now, 19-year-old James Cuz Cunningham sees Robert wearing a long black leather jacket, which was in style at the time. Cunningham told his friend, 22-year-old Justin uh, Baco, that he wanted that coat. Justin had a gun on him. They crossed the street, approached a group of three boys, one of whom was uh, Robert. Cunningham called out, hey, dude, hey, dude. Cunningham said that he liked Robert's coat and, uh, you know, told him to take it off and give it to him. And Justin pointed a gun at him and said, this is a robbery. Don't make it a homicide. Charles Alexander Foster, one of Robert's friends, told the police that his friend was getting ki uh, was killed by the Crips. Didn't end up getting shot, uh, got beat and stomped to death. And this seems to have been the first time that many of the area's police, many people in the city in general, had ever heard of the Crips. First time they get any press. Foster only confessed because his grandma came to meet him at the police station after he got arrested, slapped him in the face until he talked. Detective Al Castaldo said, if it wasn't for that grandma, I don't think we would have ever solved that killing. That's a fucking tough-ass grandma. Uh, Bloods now be formed as a direct response to the Crips, I said. This formation a few years in the making. Another inciting incident reported in sources had occurred a few years earlier in the late 60s. Ray and gang members who had become the Crips uh, attacked two Centennial High School students in Compton. Sylvester Scott and Benson Owens, known as the founders of the Bloods. Scott and Owens, they didn't just take these beatings and go on about their day like nothing happened, right? They wanted to make sure it didn't happen again. They wanted a chance at revenge. They wanted, according to one source I found, to build up a bigger gang, find Ray and his Crips, slap them around a bit, and then take off their pants, and then take off their undies, right? But leave their shoes on, leave their shirts on. And then they wanted to jerk them off until they all came. Not for sexual reasons, though. They said it was, quote, the founders of the Bloods uh, said it was a, a no homo jerk. They said they wanted to make sure that their penises just didn't get too hard for the next part. And once these guys were all definitely jerked off into the street, uh, the winning gang, right? The Bloods would grab their wieners again, yank on them real hard, stretch them out as far as possible. And once they were totally stretched, these gangsters uh, made the losing jerked off gangsters stand in groups of four people facing each other, groups of fours. And their wieners were pulled out until all the four wieners would touch in the middle. And then they would glue them together. And then the winning gang would get a bunch of old tires and then they've been, they've been gathered for this moment, giant tires, like for heavy equipment. And they wanted to make these losing crip guys in groups of four stand in the middle of these tires and then pile the tires up around them and then glue them together with leftover glue that they didn't use on the wieners. And now, and then they did do this. Each group of four losers forms a human axle in the middle of these big tires. And then the winners roll these crips down a street yelling stuff like, look at these uh, crips of bobs that we made because we're tough. We're tougher than the Crips. We're rolling Crip stickers. And someone thought they said rolling crickets. And then someone was like, thought they said uh, bloods. And that's, anyway, after parading these guys around, they rolled them down a giant hill that you don't know about. Don't even look for it on a map. And these guys, the tires would peel apart. And then eventually the guy's wieners peeled apart. And that is how Raymond Washington got his nickname, the Headless Horseman. That, well, that, and he also used to ride a horse a lot and wear a cowboy hat. And I'll stop. Now, and now it feels awkward. I made it awkward. I made it, I made it on purpose awkward. Obviously, the source I used for that information is a liar. And I'm not going to use them again. I'm not going to let them trick me again. Uh, most reputable sources say that after their beatdown by Ray and his crip, Scott forms the Pyru Gang and Owens forms the West Pyru Gang. Bad kind of butterfly effect here. Violence created more violence, right? Numerous small street gangs on or near South Central's Pyru Street refuse to join the Crips and instead form new alliances for protection. These affiliated gangs become the Bloods. By late 1972, after so much more violence, after, you know, more guys got rolled down hills and their fucking wieners got torn apart. I'm going to try and keep selling that. June 5th, 1972, just three months after Bayou's murder, Frederick Lowcountry Garrett murdered by a Westside Crip. 
That marks the first known Crips murder against another gang member and also motivates non-Crip gangs to align with each other. Garrett was a member of a South Central gang called the Brims. The Brims struck back August 4th, 1972, murdering Thomas Ellis, an original West Side Crip. By late 1972, the Pyrus held a meeting in their neighborhood to discuss growing Crip pressure and intimidation. That Bayou murder, the press that accompanied it, you know, raised the Crips profile, gave them extra street cred that increased their membership. Several gangs felt victimized by the growing Crips, right? They joined the Pyrus, created a new federation of non-Crips, and that alliance again becomes the Bloods. So the Pyrus are considered the founders of the Bloods. The Bloods wore red to distinguish themselves from the Crips, came up with their own hand signs, distinguishing tattoos. The Bloods membership increased in the 1970s, but they never reached the numbers that the Crips had. Uh, still having today, right? Uh, to remain competitive with the Crips, they became especially violent. The Crips typically outnumbered the Bloods three to one, and the Bloods couldn't overcome those numbers without weapons. So tired of getting their asses kicked by gangs with uh, more members and fistfights, they started bringing uh, guns to even the score. Initially, these guns, not Uzis, not machine guns, uh, revolvers, shotguns. Dangerous, yeah, but they're not uh, typical drive-by weapons. Innocent bystanders, right? And uh, getting shot in gang warfare, super rare in the 1970s because they're not firing lots of shots. From 1972 to 1979, the rivalry between the Bloods and Crips worsens, leads to about 450 gang-related murders in South Central uh, Los Angeles. Ray Washington is disappointed with the extreme amount of gun violence in the city. He prefers to settle arguments with his fists, but it's not his gang anymore. Not long after he founded the Crips, he lost his position to leadership, thanks to getting his wiener ripped off when he got rolled down that hill. You know, that's what that one source said. No, uh, incarceration and disillusion. 1974, 21-year-old Washington was arrested for second-degree robbery and sentenced to five years imprisonment at the Dual Vocational Institution in Tracy, a state prison that just closed down uh, last year, actually. Uh, became the first crypt to be incarcerated there. Not a fun designation. Uh, Washington was less than popular with the prison population. When he first showed up, he tried to recruit right young black inmates into the crypts, uh, much to the disapproval of the established black prison protection groups already there, like the black Muslims and the black guerrilla family. And he was not successful. According to a former inmate who was housed at Duel with Washington, the black Muslims and the black guerrilla family, well aware of the spread of the Crips in South Central, warned Washington they're not going to tolerate that shit in their prison. And then Washington, again, the lone member of the Crips in this prison, faced another problem while serving time at Duel. The Crips are murdering rival gang members on the streets of L.A. while he's incarcerated. Inmates at Duel are sometimes relatives of the victims. Uh, they're being, you know, these people being killed and they hold Washington solely responsible for their relatives' deaths. Greg Batman Davis, a friend of Washington and an original Crips member stated that people in the prisons were losing their loved ones on the streets and because Raymond was the founder of the Crips, they blamed him for it. And since Ray was the only Crip up there at the time, they were trying to kill him. That's fucking terrifying. How would you like to be public enemy number one in a prison where you have no allies? How long do you think you would last? I wouldn't give myself a week. But because this dude was apparently one of the toughest motherfuckers of all time, no one even heard him. <laughs> That's just preposterous. I'm not going to lie. I wish video existed of some of his fights. I feel like he was like backyard brawl, Kimbo slice times 10. Like he was like, like a cheat code in a video game. 1976, Washington paroled uh, from prison, returns to South Central. The headless horseman rides a mighty steed over into Compton, right down Pyru Street, dares the crew from earlier to try and take the rest of his wiener. <laughs> Sorry. I have a hard time letting that stupid joke go. No, reportedly he's uh, shocked to discover the violent war between the Crips, Bloods, some new Hispanic gangs that had escalated to the point of uh, fighting with guns, that that was all the new normal. No more fist fighting. Over the next few months, Washington becomes uh, further disillusioned with the Crips as the gang commits uh, more of what he sees as unnecessarily violent, senseless crimes, new recruits seeking to build more violent reputations than existing members. Shit's just getting out of hand. In the two-ish years of Washington's incarceration, the organization had quickly and totally broken down into loosely affiliated decentralized sets. They were often fighting each other, right? Uh, Crips' original leadership had disappeared, even though there was still uh, uh, another original leader out there on the streets. Uh, let's check in with Tukey. Tukey Williams, right, served as the de facto leader during Washington's imprisonment, but he got injured in a rare early drive-by shooting in 1976 before Washington's release, and uh, he had developed a real nasty PCP habit that had caused his authority to wane a bit. Man, fucking PCP. You can talk about that in a second. Uh, 1979, Tookie will be uh, arrested and charged with four counts of murder. Accused of murdering 26-year-old Albert Owens, a 7-Eleven clerk. Also acu accused of murdering three members of the same family, the Yang family. 76-year-old uh, Yeno, 63-year-old uh, uh, Sai Shai, and 43-year-old Yu Chin. On February 28, 1979, Tookie and three other people 
were riding in a car together looking to uh, get some money to buy some more PCP. They were already high on PCP and they wanted more. So they decided to rob a store to get some money. And they found a 7-Eleven in Whittier. Store clerk Albert Lewis Owens, who was sweeping the parking lot, entered the store to serve him. Tukey, according to an accomplice, Alfred Blackie Coward, pulled a shotgun. His name is spelled Coward. I, I assume it's kind of an unfortunate last name for a gang member. Uh, pulled a shotgun on Owens, told him to head to the back. Blackie stole about 120 bucks in the register while Tukey makes Owens lie down on the floor, shoots him twice in the back with that shotgun. Uh, next three murders take place March 11th when Stanley and an accomplice break into the Brookhaven Motel at 10 4 11 South Vermont Avenue in South Central at 5 a.m. and then murder the three members of the Yang family I mentioned earlier who owned and ran the motel. Uh, the Yang's immigrants from Taiwan. Uh, Williams entered the lobby, broke down the door that led to the private office inside, shoots and kills. Again, the 76-year-old father, his 63-year-old wife, and their 43-year-old daughter. Then empties the cash register and flees the scene. The, uh, Yang's son, uh, Robert, asleep with his wife in the bedroom at the motel, was awakened by the sound of somebody breaking down the door to the motel's office. Shortly thereafter, hears a female scream, followed by gunshots, enters the motel office, finds his mom, sister, dad, all shot to death, cash register is empty. A forensic pathologist testified that his dad suffered two close-range shotgun blasts, one to his left arm uh, and abdomen, one to his lower left chest. Mom received two close-range shotgun blasts, one to her tailbone, other to the front of her stomach. Sister shot once to the face from point-blank range. Uh, witnesses later testified that Williams referred to the victims in conversations later with friends as Buddha heads. So fairly uh, racist. Uh, how much money did he get from killing three fucking people from the same family? 50 bucks. He was arrested shortly after these killings. Well, uh, Tukey will deny these killings for the entirety, entirety of his later incarceration. Three of his friends, numerous others would testify that he did confess to them. Ballistic evidence would link his shotgun uh, to one of the murder scenes as well. Williams will be sentenced to death in 1981 for these four homicides. More on that in just a bit. Just five months after the Yang murders, less than five months after one co-founder of the Crips is arrested, put in prison for life, other co-founder is killed. August 9th, 1979, Raymond Washington is murdered, a murder that is still unsolved. He was shot with a sawed-off shotgun while standing in the street. He was killed most likely by someone he knew, just based on him approaching the car on the corner of 64th and San Pedro streets. Someone inside the vehicle called his name, he approached the car, and then he got shot. Still had a heartbeat when the ambulance arrived, but was uh, uh, dead by the time he got to the hospital. There were rumors that the Hoover Crips were responsible, the Eastside Crips and the Hoovers engaged in retaliation shootings after Raymond's murder. Kind of ironic, the different sets of the gang he founded for protection would attack each other after he died by the hands of one of their members. After Ray's death, the Crips further unraveled into more and more sets as they fought with each other, fought with other gangs like the Bloods. South Center became more violent and chaotic. And uh, now for more info on Tukey's trial real quick. Stanley Williams convicted of four counts of murder, two counts of robbery, March 13th, 1981. He was actually charged with four counts of first degree murder, three counts of robbery with use of a firearm one count of kidnapping, and eight special circumstances of robbery, murder, and multiple murder. His trial had begun a month previously, February 10th, 1981. Alfred Blackie Coward was the prosecution star witness for the first killing of that 7-Eleven, offered immunity to testify. Not uncommon, but obviously it's always a little bit of a conflict of interest. Uh, said that at 10.30 a.m., February 27th, 1979, Tukey came to Coward's house. They drove to James Garrett's house because Williams was staying there at the time. Tukey went into the house, came back with his shot-off shotgun, and a man named Daryl. They smoked cigarettes, laced with PCP, then picked up a, uh, a man named Tony Sims. And then they uh, shared another PCP cigarette. And I say cigarette, the joint. Fucking PCP, man. I've never done it. Never even been around it as far as I know. Uh, let me share a bit about what this uh, stuff is since I forgot. PCP also knows angel dust, rocket fuel, ozone, or WAC. Uh, its chemical name is uh, whew, phenylcyclohexyl. Phenylcyclohexyl Paparidine. Actually, I think I got that right. Uh, defined as a dissociative hallucinogenic drug that may cause hallucinations, uh, distorted perceptions of sounds, and violent behavior. Very violent. Out of all the hallucinatory drugs, PCP gained the worst reputation in the 60s and 70s for inciting violence. Sometimes people would lose their fucking minds, go berserker on hospital staff, law enforcement, whoever while high on PCP. Doesn't seem like it's very gentle, like shrooms or DMT. It was developed and marketed in the 1950s as an intravenous uh, anesthetic by Park Davis and Company, now a subsidiary of Pfizer. Uh, it's used for humans, discontinued in 1965. It caused patients to become agitated, delusional, irrational, and, you know, violent. 
After being discontinued, it was used as a tranquilizer for animals by vets for uh, numerous years, and then now no longer used in any medical capacity, and almost exclusively found in the U.S. Uh, Super hard to find now, but pretty popular in the late 60s and 70s. When crack showed up, PCP dropped off dramatically in popularity and has never really regained popularity. Mainly taken with weed, uh, joints would be dipped in it. My dad smoked a bit of weed when he was younger, just a bit, and uh, quit after he ended up thinking he smoked a joint that had been dipped in PCP. He said it made him feel super crazy. It really freaked him out. It's probably, you know, his way of admitting that he uh, killed a bunch of people while he was high. You know, you get it. Uh, if you've listened for a while, you get it. Uh, back to Tukey. After gathering a small crew and smoking a bunch of angel dust, he asked Tony Sims if he knew where they could make money. Using two cars, they drove to the city, attempted to first rob a restaurant and then a liquor store. Neither place felt right, so they moved on uh, and ended up at that 7-Eleven. Sims and Darrow went into the store. Store clerk Albert Owens. Tukey Coward followed. Tukey forces Owens you know, into the back, you know, makes him lie down, like I said earlier. Uh, shot at the TV monitor, then shot t- uh, Owens twice. Later, after they went back to Sims' house, Tukey said he shot Owens because he didn't want to leave a witness. Also said that the shells couldn't be traced, and he picked them all up. Uh, Robert Yang testified against Tukey at the uh, trial for the next three murders, right, of his family members at the Brookhaven Motel. Two shotgun shell casings would be found at that crime scene, and a firearms expert later testified that one of the shells uh, conclusively came from Tukey's gun that he had bought in 1974. Four witnesses identified him as the perpetrator. Witness Samuel Coleman testified that he and Tukey went to a bar. Coleman stayed at the bar until 6 a.m. on the 11th, last seen Tukey at 2.30 a.m. Next day, he said Tukey admitted to robbing and killing people on Vermont Street, where the hotel was located. James and Esther Garrett also testified against Williams. Williams was staying with the Garretts when the murders occurred. On March 13th, Williams told James Garrett that he heard about how some Chinese people on Vermont Street had been killed. Claimed he didn't know how it happened, but the killer must have been professional because there was no shells left behind, no witnesses. Then later he spoke with James Garrett again, described the murder in detail, said that a, a big guy knocked the door down and then indicated that he was that big guy. And again, Tukey was fucking huge. Uh, Esther Garrett testified that Williams uh, told her and her husband that the Brookhaven killers used the money to buy PCP, collected shotgun shells so they wouldn't leave evidence behind. Also told Esther Garrett alone that he and his brother-in-law committed the crime. Next witness was an inmate Tukey spoke to after being arrested, George Oglesby. Testified that Tukey admitted to shooting a man, woman, and child during a motel robbery. Also testified about Sandy Williams' escape plan. Oglesby uh, was invited to escape with him. He planned to escape during a bus ride from jail to court, but then Tukey canceled his escape attempt because he wasn't sure that he and Oglesby would be transferred to court at the same time. And he thought two police vehicles would be following the bus. Uh, Tukey did also have a few people testify on his behalf. His stepfather, Fred uh, Hollowell, and a few others testified that he got to the showcase bar at 3.30 a.m. March 11th, thought he saw Stanley in the showcase parking lot around 5 a.m., remembered seeing him because Williams was involved in an altercation that resulted in a cut across his chest. Eugene Riley, an inmate, testified that he saw Williams in the showcase parking lot at 5 a.m. March 11th, gave him a ride around 5.30 a.m. Joseph McFarland, also an inmate, testified that Oglesby was a jailhouse rat and other inmates gave him false info because they knew he was a government informant. After it was all said and done, March 13th, 1981, Tukey was convicted of four counts of first-degree murder, right? And the two counts of robbery using a firearm uh, with eight special circumstances of robbery, murder, and multiple murder. And he was sentenced to death on April 15th. After his conviction, he would spend over six years in solitary confinement for assaulting various guards and inmates at San Quentin. Damn. Some point during all that solitary, Tukey uh, found God. He converted to something and became an advocate against gang violence. I must have read through 30 articles about this dude. Not one of them uh, identified exactly which religion he converted to. The closest I got to a definitive answer was in an article about his son, uh, Trayvon Williams, also a crip for a time who converted to Christianity, said he wanted to carry on his father's legacy and bring people out of the gang and over to God. So I assume Christianity. Uh, Tukey will file a federal appeal in 1988 and I imagine prayed about it a, a whole bunch. But then, plot twist, Jesus literally told him to go fuck himself and his appeal was denied. Come on, JK, I don't know what Jesus said, uh, but his appeal, uh, appeal really was denied. More on what he goes on to do from prison later. Right now, let's uh, smoke some crack or talk about it at the very least. South Central LA, combination of gang activity, lack of jobs leads to more people using crack in the 1980s. Between 1979 and 1994, 5,541 total homicides occur in LA County. During this period, the proportion of all homicides that were gang related increases from 18% to 43%, reaches epidemic proportions. Right, the crack epidemic hit LA in 1981 and exploded. By 1982, old freeway Rick Ross rolling into LA uh, with uh, crack by the metric ton. Too much in this episode to really dig into, 
uh, as far as how the, the crack epidemic, you know, the, all the stats with it and everything. That's an entire episode and a lengthy one in and of itself. Uh, just a few details that pertain to this episode for now. And the most important one is, you know, who sold the Bloods and Crips crack? Like, how did it first get to South Central? Bear Evil Incorporated. They brought crack into South Central and sold the gangs all their guns, too. Why? Because there was fucking money in it. You stupid piece of shit. Greed is good. Money is all that matters. And no one makes more money than Bear because they're smarter than you, better than you, and most importantly, wealthier than you. Bear is the only corporation in the world with the balls to admit they only care about money and don't give a damn about their customers or human life in general. Bear, they'll sell crack to babies if there's profit in it. Hell, they'll turn babies into crack if there's money to be made there. Bear, only in it for the money. Man, I knew Bear was evil, but holy shit. Let me share some crack-related info now that is, uh, you know, not just real in the suck verse. Uh, between 1984 and 1989, nationwide, during the height of the crack epidemic, the homicide, ra- homicide rate for black males age 14 to 17 more than doubles. The homicide rate for black males age 18 to 24 increases nearly as much. During this period, the black community also experiences a 20 to 100% increase based on what study you look at in fetal death rates, low birth uh, weight babies, weapon arrests, and the number of children in foster care. In 1986, the U.S. Congress, in its infamous fucked up wisdom, passed laws that created a 100 to 1 sentencing disparity for the possession or trafficking of crack when compared to penalties for powder cocaine, a move widely criticized as being blatantly discriminatory against African Americans and other racial minorities who were much more likely to use crack than powder cocaine. This fucked up nonsensical, blatantly racist 100 to 1 ratio, then mandated by federal law in 1986, Persons convicted in federal court of possession of five grams of crack cocaine received a minimum mandatory sentence of five years in federal prison. Minimum. And with the three strikes and you're out bullshit, three arrests for just five grams of crack apiece puts you in prison for life. On the other hand, you had to possess 500 grams of powder cocaine to get the same. That's a fucking Scarface level of coke. That's an absurd amount. Five grams of crack is a tiny amount comparatively. That's like getting the same prison sentence for having either a, uh, a little 10 milligram weed gummy or 150 joints. It's nonsensical. It's stupid. So many laws truly are passed by complete idiots. Uh, fun fact, you don't have to know fuck all about drugs or anything else at all to become an elected official. Super cool. You don't have to be literate. It's awesome. Uh, 2010, the Fair Sentencing Act cuts the sentencing disparity to 18 to 1. Oh, how kind. What a nice gesture of mercy. Get the fuck out of here. Fuck the war on drugs. Fuck dumb shit politicians who still push that propaganda. Uh, The crack epidemic combined with these sentencing laws gutted South Central and surrounding black communities. More and more young black men, when they're not getting shot down in increasingly violent confrontations with gangsters who are now able to upgrade their arsenals significantly to military-grade weapons because of all that crack profit, they're going to jail for nonviolent crime for selling or using crack, leaving more and more families without fathers, without older brothers. And the cycle of violence, broken homes, hopelessness, and bad role models leading to more violence, broken homes, hopelessness, and bad role models continues and intensifies. The crack epidemic, which actually hit the Northeast harder than California, led also to the Crips and Bloods expanding across the country, right, to find new buyers to sell this crack for a variety of, uh, you know, drug cartels. In the 80s, sets of Bloods and Crips become crack cocaine's biggest distributors, form alliances with uh, mostly Mexican drug cartels. A 1989 Washington Post article reports that LA gangs moved out of the city as far away as Baltimore. They recruited new members, sold drugs across the nation. The California Office of Justice report provided further details about this uh, transition in gang structure. Not sure how this compares to gang structure hierarchy today. The date of the publication listed as unknown, but the recent legislation it references was passed in 1988. So I'm going to assume it's from around that time, 89, 90. Uh, Gangs, it said, are hiring younger boys as lookouts often as young as 12. Their job is to watch for police and rival gang members, and they get paid over 100 bucks a day. Cash, obviously, for doing this work. Next level up is a runner, uh, often also someone under the age of 18 or at least someone without much of a criminal record, hopefully no criminal record. Runner transports drugs from the uh, people who make them to dealers for about $300 a day. Runners are assigned to retaliate against rival gang members because young gang, mem- gang members 
or uh, you know, gang members without a record record are going to get uh, probation or a light sentence for a first time offense if they get caught. Next level up is a dealer. Dealers are making anywhere from five hundred to two thousand dollars a day. Two thousand dollars a day cash, right? And probably eighty nine or ninety. No degree, no job references required. Then there are the uh, were the gang godfathers. Gang godfathers at the top of the hierarchy, often the ones who deal directly with drug cartels. The report states in the past, the Crips and Bloods seem to be primarily involved in predatory crimes in the L.A. area. Today, law enforcement authorities throughout California and other states are reporting the widespread movement of Crips and Bloods from the L.A. area into their jurisdictions. Gang members are being linked to the increasing sales of rock cocaine in cities across the nation and to the establishment of rock cocaine houses, right? Crack houses. Their eagerness to cash in on the lucrative rock cocaine trade has heightened their enthusiasm to expand their operations in pursuit of new markets. These new illicit drug markets are known by law enforcement officials as virgin territories. When gang members arrive at a virgin territory, rock cocaine samples are given away to prospective customers in hopes of getting them hooked on the cocaine, thus providing gang members with new customers. With expansion of the drug markets, the Crips and Bloods are undergoing a change from local retailers to national wholesalers, thus eliminating the middleman. In the past, most of the gang's strength and numbers has been offset by poor organization and a lack of leadership, but the Crips and the Bloods are changing the way they do business. Their new focus is on increasing profits, removing themselves from the streets where they're at most risk of being arrested or killed, and evolving into organized crime groups. Uh, it doesn't seem that that's uh, fully happened from other things I've read. That they have uh, still not really become like fully, fully organized. Not most of these sets. Uh, in response to the crack epidemic and gangs becoming more militarized, the police becoming more militarized, or they become more militarized, excuse me, using assault weapons, special forces, tactical training to raid drug houses. Uh, you know what didn't happen in response to all this? A lot of money being poured into preventative education and rehab. You know what almost no public money was poured into? Uh, creating good uh, paying inner city job opportunities or upgrading the educational infrastructure with, say, good food and daycare programs for impoverished uh, single-parent households. If you don't build hope, this fucking cycle will always continue. You can't punish a population into staying away from escapist drugs and illegal income opportunities if you left them in a hopeless environment created not all that long ago by the same government now punishing them in ways predictable to basic behaviorists. Yeah. Uh, by the late 80s, the entire country now begins to learn about the Bloods and Crips, as well as the culture of South Central L.A. Movies like Boys in the Hood, 1991, Menace to Society, 1993, uh, bring further awareness of these gangs. I love both of those movies, right? Fucking love the Menace to Society soundtrack. DJ Quick, Ice Cube, NWA, Too Short, Boogie Down Productions. Grunge reported by the mid-90s, the image of the South Central Gangster had captured the country's imagination the same way the cowboy once did. Teenagers fashioned themselves as gangsters, even if they lived in wealthy neighborhoods. This media popularity helped and hurt the gang's public image. A lot of people felt like these movies increased prejudice against black people in the U.S. And looking back, I agree with that sentiment. I didn't realize it at the time. At the time, I thought this media popularity, uh, you know, was uh, doing a big service, <laughs> getting the word out about a lot of black Americans. Made me a huge fan of uh, black Americans, but I see it differently now, right? I was one of the idiot white kids who didn't know shit about how horrific all this stuff really was, how sad and racist and terrible. I thought it was kind of cool. I just heard good music. Right? Watch good movies, good music videos featuring fucking hot ass girls dancing around, loving these guys. You know, movies featuring young dudes who weren't much older than I was, who seemed so tough and fearless, and I admired them. These gangsters did seem like modern Western gunslingers because I've also always liked the cowboy genre, right? And just like some kids dressed up like cowboys, I dressed up like a gangster. Fucking ridiculous. I was a skinny, clueless white kid, little 500, less than 500 person, white Idaho town, listening to South Central hip hop, had a subscription to the source, sagging my jeans, wearing an oversized big starter jacket, notches in my eyebrow, hoop earrings, shaved my head down to look so tough. Oh, fuck. I wasn't tough. I was a fucking poser. Uh, I ended up with a, a real fucked up vision of what I considered to be black culture, right? I now associate a black culture, not with the broad spectrum of humanity, it includes fucking doctors, professors, whatever, you know, the truth for any culture. It always exists on a broad spectrum. Instead, I almost only saw gangsters and, well, gangsters and athletes, right? And that was mostly it. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't instill that or that, that didn't instill a little fear of the black man into me, right? Luckily, that went away for me a few years later when I went to college and learned the truth. The black culture has just as many fucking dorks in it as white culture does. I see you black nerds, emo kids, grunge kids. Uh, but really the whole situation, you know, all fucked up. The hood of South Central was rotting, real people dying, the living, living in fear and hopelessness. And instead of media focused on South Central spreading uh, empathy, 
Movies and music are monetizing the pain in ways that did little to nothing to help the plight of anyone actually living in the neighborhoods being immortalized and romanticized. I mean, imagine if your childhood home was in a war zone or is in a war zone and now music and movies are made about the pain that you've endured, right? And now people all over the country live in way better neighborhoods, safer homes than you do, more food, more shelter, love, et cetera, people with more opportunities than you have by far, people whose friends and families and neighbors aren't literally dying and being incarcerated month after month and they start dressing like you because it's fun. Come on, it's cool. It's almost like they're dressing up uh, like you for Halloween. Hey, everybody, look at me. I'm a, I'm a gangbanger. Ha, cool. Man, college is so fun. Hey, careful. Walk back in your dorms, everybody. I heard somebody got followed around by someone who kind of creepy last week on campus. It's so dangerous here. It's like we're living in the hood too. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty fucked up when you really like, look at it. By 1990, most major U.S. cities had bloods, crips, both. By 1990, the crips numbers exceeded 35,000 in just L.A. County, making them the largest gang in the U.S. by far. There was also 15 to 20,000 bloods. Uh, a lot of gang members in the early 1990s, some East Coast Bloods, also known as United Blood Nation, formed by inmates at Rikers Island. Soon these East Coast Bloods came to outnumber the Crips in New York City. Then on April 28, 1992, something happens that actually slows down Bloods and Crips violence. The Bloods and Crips join together to establish a historic peace treaty. Hundreds of Bloods and Crips gather outside the Nickerson Gardens housing project to make the truce official. One unidentified gang member told a reporter, I do drive-by shootings. I kidnap babies. I kill people. So what? I'm an active gang member. I'm going to stop. Check the homicide rate in Watts next year this time, fool. Uh, but then the very next day, L.A. residents began rioting after four LAPD officers found not guilty for the beating of Rodney King. So would the truce hold? It actually did. Gang-related crime decreased in L.A. by 1993. Even with all the fucking Rodney King shit, the L.A. Times later wrote on the 30th anniversary of the historic truce, the Watts Treaty originated from the desire of some gang leaders to end the death and violence that plagued their community. They were motivated to protect their families and friends from indiscriminate shootings and targeted attacks. They recognized law enforcement could not, would not end the violence. These leaders, Akila and uh, Daoud uh, Shrills, Twilight Bay, Anthony Perry, uh, Dwayne Holmes, Tony Bogard, and others saw the devastating struggle between gangs as analogous to military conflict, complete with no man's land where rivals would be shot on sight. The use of assault weapons, targeted killings, and civilian casualties. They realized such violence required a diplomatic solution. So Akilah Shrills and his brother, uh, Daoud, uh, along with their friends, went to the four biggest housing projects in Watts to start some peace talks. Akilah uh, attended Cal State Northridge and read books like The Autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, The Evidence of Things Not Seen. Uh, Shrills later wrote, these things challenged me. They politicized me. They also gave me courage and language to begin to speak with folks in the neighborhood about what was happening. Akilah, a member of the Grape Street, Grape Street Crips, uh, began talking with his fellow gang members and Bloods. The official truce was the result of years of meetings and peace talks. Various gang leaders visited local libraries looking for templates for their peace agreements. It was Anthony Perry who found the 1949 armistice agreement between Israel and Egypt, which ended the uh, Arab-Israeli war. The main creator of that treaty was Ralph Bunch, black man from L.A. He received a Nobel Peace Prize for his mediation work during the war. Uh, and his work on the treaty. And when the people working on the 1992 truce learned that info, they felt like it was a sign that that was a template they should go forward with. Perry handed copies of the armistice agreement uh, out to, you know, various gang members. The treaty was established between the Grape Street Crips, PJ Watts Crips, Bounty Hunter Bloods, and the Hacienda Village Bloods. According to Aquila, the OGs were skeptical of the truce, that it would really work, while the younger members celebrated the peace. The Crips and Bloods spent the night, uh, you know, partying together. The night of the peace treaty, the agreement was crucial in decreasing the gang rate in L.A. High-ranking gang members acted as enforcers to keep other members from breaking the truce. After the 1992 riots, a program called Rebuild L.A. Uh, then promised to create lasting change. The $6 billion program was supposed to establish long-term systemic change by creating over 70,000 new jobs in the riot zone over a five-year period. This, combined with the truce, created a new sense of hope that some real change was finally going to happen in the city. Fuck yeah, right? No. Only a year later, Rebuild LA just shuts down. Those jobs were not created. Once again, the city chooses not to invest in infrastructure that will actually help South Central. Once again, residents are reminded, right, that to the rest of the country, they do not fucking matter. According to uh, Shirils, the peace lasted about 10 years despite all that before violence started up all over again. Alex Alonzo, expert on LA gangs, told KPCC, there is a newer generation of gang member who decide that they do not want to be part of the truce. The identity of the gang is more important to them and fighting over the identity consumes them. 
Shootings and crime continued during the truce. They did continue, uh, just not at the rate that occurred before or after it. Then after it, obviously, it just spikes way back up again. Sadly, uh, Akilah Sharil's son killed in gang violence just after the truce ended in 2004. Uh, Grunge reported on the truce saying it was the truly grassroots effort that evolved over time. One conversation leading to another. One friend encouraging another friend to rethink their decisions. Gang activity and murder rates in Watts dropped dramatically, served as an example for other neighborhoods. Unfortunately, without economic improvements, the decision on whether or not to join a gang remained a difficult one. Exactly. You don't repair the underlying conditions, right? You just put a bandaid on a bullet wound. Uh, 1997 now, Stanley Tukey Williams, Crips co-founder, apologizes for his role in founding the Crips, saying, I am no longer part of the problem. Thanks to the almighty, I am no longer sleepwalking through life. I didn't actually hear a real apology there. Didn't hear, I'm sorry, but okay, something. Uh, in the early 2000s, the FBI reports on increased blood and Crip gang activity in the military now. Hunter Glass, gang expert and veteran, interviewed with WP, WBTV, and showed them a video of soldiers in a nightclub in Fort Bragg using their hands to chant Crips. People across the room throwing gang signs that meant Crip killers. Uh, WBTV obtained pictures showing gang graffiti in Iraq. They also found pictures of men in military uniforms posted on a 18th Street gang website, as well as a man doing a gang sign on an army recruiting chat room. I'm sure a lot of that was real, but how much of it was real and how much of it was idiots like me throwing the blood sign, <laughs> which I don't want to do on video. I don't want to fucking piss anybody off, but I did throw it in the suck dungeon. The other day, and immediately Lindsay and Logan threw it too. <laughs> the one person who didn't, uh, the only black member of our four person office, uh, Tyler. He was the only one of us with any sense to realize how fucking stupid it was for any of us to know this in the first place. Estimated that at least 1% of the military, about 14,000 people at any given time, affiliated with a street gang. Uh, 2008 LA investigator detective. Uh, L.A. investigator Detective Adam Torres told WBTV that the FBI is concerned about gang members using military training when it uh, goes to battle against, uh, you know, other rival street gangs. 2002, member of the Swiss Parliament nominates Stanley Tookie Williams for a Nobel Peace Prize. Williams had many supporters because of the work he had done to speak out against gang violence in prison. During his lifetime, he was actually nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize five times and the Nobel Prize for Literature once. Later that year, Stanley uh, appeals his convictions again, and his appeal is denied. 2004, Williams helps write the Tukey Protocol for Peace, peace agreement between the Bloods and Crips. President George Bush even personally wrote him a letter commending him for his work on this. Williams implemented these strategies in prison and gangs used it outside of prison. The Guardian reported, the protocol achieved its first success in June when hundreds of members of two street gangs in New Jersey used it to bring calm to their community. In the four months before the treaty was signed, there had been 34 gang-related murders, the peace has held ever since. Williams also published his memoir, Blue Rage, Black Redemption, that same year. The purpose of the memoir was to tell his life story, share the true story of the Crips, and warn young people about the dangers of gang life. 2005, Stanley petitions for clemency. December 8, 2005, California Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger. I wonder if he ever fucking uh, lifted back at uh, Gold's Gym with, uh, with uh, you know, uh, Tukey. Uh, but he agrees to meet with him to hear his case. The defense and prosecution each have 30 minutes to present their arguments. Williams and his lawyers maintained his innocence in the original killings, argued that his efforts to change his life showed he no longer deserved to be executed. His lawyers asked an important question again uh, that was never taken seriously during Tukey's original trial, which is pretty messed up. And that question is, where the fuck was my dad? Seriously, on the two nights when those four murders were committed in 1979, no one knows for sure where my dad is. And I fucking know that my dad smoked PCP. He smoked PCP sometime around 1979 and he kills people. Where the fuck was he getting his PCP? South Central? My dad was born in Los Angeles. He has ties to the area. Also, according to my most recent 23andMe genetic analysis, I'll fucking prove this on social media if I have to. I'm 0.8% North African. My dad could be twice that. Did he grow up as a white guy in Alaska and Idaho or as a black man in South Central? Was he a crip? Was he a blood? He's good with his guns and his fists. I don't know, but someone needs to fucking ask him these questions after they arrest him. When is he going to get arrested? When is he finally going to have to fucking pay his dues? <laughs> pay his dues? But I don't know what I'm talking about. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> his attorneys did not say anything about my dad, as far as I know, but they probably should have. Dad watch. Never forget. Uh, Stanley's attorney, Peter Fleming, said in a news conference, this is life. Uh, this, sorry, this is a life whose message has resonated with children, particularly with the people of California. This is the man who has not only redeemed himself, but he has sent his message of redemption and nonviolence to the people of California and all over the country. Those who argued that Williams should not be executed said that killing him would just show other gang members that there's no point in reforming because even if they change their lives, there's no hope for them. 
Stanley's defense pointed out how uh, the only physical evidence connecting Williams to the murders was shell casings that matched a gun he owned. His defense questioned the ballistics uh, testing. Yes, witnesses testified that they heard Stanley admit to uh, and brag about killings, but according to the defense, all of the witnesses had motives to lie. One witness was allegedly an accomplice who was granted immunity, right, which we know uh, from prosecution. Other, another was a criminal. Prosecution also dismissed literally all potential black jurors, which made the jury racially biased, and that is super fucked up. That was not a jury of his peers. Uh, Williams told the Associated Press, there is no part of me that existed then that exists now. The majority of the detractors and naysayers, it's difficult for them to recognize the redemption. They've been unable to stop smoking or drinking or lose weight. And then they're looking at me in San Quentin and they say, this man is on death row convicted of killing four people. How can he be redeemed? They can't believe that. They don't want to believe that. They would then feel lesser about themselves. And that's not a bad argument. Uh, for me, though, there are some acts that disqualify you for a chance of redemption. I'm not a religious man. I do not always believe uh, in turning uh, the other cheek, you know, or granting redemption, forgiveness. I mean, if Tukey actually did not commit those four murders, then yeah, I obviously should not have been ever put in death row in the first place, uh, did not deserve to die. But if he did commit those four murders, if he really did wipe out almost the entire Yang family to get less than a hundred bucks to buy some PCP with, then I don't think he deserved the opportunity to write any of the books that he wrote in the first place, right? That made people love him later. Especially if he didn't ever admit to killing them, which he, which he didn't. You know, the Yangs, where, where is their chance for redemption? What life story did they get to keep writing after the day the jury decided they met Crips founder uh, Stanley Tookie Williams? Right? If you molest 100 kids, but then write the best book ever written to teach kids how to stay away from pedophiles later in prison, should you receive clemency in that situation? I don't know. I mean, he did do so much good work. I, I, I do think like, okay, prison for life. Instead of the ex, you know being executed, that's ah, tough. December 13th, 2005, 51-year-old Williams is executed by lethal injection. His final request for clemency denied on December 12th. Uh, Governor Schwarzenegger wrote about his decision. Is Williams' redemption complete and sincere or just a hollow promise? Without an apology, an atonement for the senseless and brutal killings, there can be no redemption. If he would have admitted to these killings, I think he probably would have received clemency. And I understand not admitting if he truly wasn't guilty, if he didn't do them. But, I mean, I'm skeptical. What if his entire redemption act was built on a lie? On refusing to own up to the four murders. Yes, still did good things, but it's like, ah, that's fucking, yeah, it's tough. Uh, Bloods and Crips still killing each other today. Now they just compete with a lot more gangs, primarily Latin gangs like MS-13. Uh, there are 10,000 members of just that gang in the U.S., about 70,000 members worldwide. A lot of the street gangs are online now, right? Gangs posting on YouTube to intimidate others. Gangs posting videos about beating somebody up or videos of them shooting and showing off guns. These videos get millions of views, which causes concern about how uh, many of these viewers are then recruited to join these gangs. I watched a video from uh, last year about Bloods and Crips in South Central. Super interesting. Uh, over 5 million views. Social media today, the website writes, before Facebook made, made claiming a crime or arranging a friendly get-together easy, gangs would raise their numbers gradually, street corner by street corner, avenue by avenue. Now, thanks to the internet, this can be done online. And what was once a mercilessly, mercilessly slow process is done with a few left clicks of a mouse. All right, that's pretty scary. Gangs use all the social media platforms for recruitment and to uh, show off the gang lifestyle. Calvin Shivers from the FBI gang unit said it may stoke the curiosity of someone in the community. And so that is a kind of recruitment tool because now people may see this video and think that's sort of cool. Um, March 31st, 2019 now. 33-year-old rap artist Nipsey Hustle is murdered. Shot 10 times outside Marathon Clothing in South Central Los Angeles. Allegedly, his store was a gathering place for the Rolling 60s Crips. Nipsey was a former member. Some people say he was still a member. Openly spoke about his experiences with gang culture. Also uh, often performed to work with rival Bloods affiliated rappers to set an example of reaching across and being able to work with everybody. Uh, the bullets pierced his lungs, severed his spinal cord. Two other people also injured. April 2nd, Eric Holder Jr. was arrested and charged with murder, his murder, two counts of attempted murder, and one count of possession of a firearm by a felon. And Holder, also a member of the Rolling 60s Crips, and the killing was uh, supposedly personal, right? More gang violence. Nipsey started his career in a strip mall selling CDs out of his car, uh, used his fame to talk about issues relevant to his community and to try and give back to people in need, try to show his community a better way. But then someone from his old life came back and killed him. One of, again, over 15,000 people, almost all of them young men, killed in Bloods and Crips violence. And that's just, you know, up to 2009 again. Following his murder, the Bloods and Crips came together to grieve the loss and they planned a ceasefire, but not a full truce. 
Uh, as a result, though, gang-related crime in L.A. did decrease 9% from April through December of 2019 compared to the same time frame, you know, a year earlier. Another member of the Rolling 60s told the L.A. Times, we're going to carry what Nipsey wanted, what he was trying to preach in his songs. It doesn't make no sense that you're fighting over a block that you don't own. That is very profound, right? Fighting over a block that you do not own. Hmm. So where does it all go from here? Uh, only time will tell, but if economic conditions in America's poorest neighborhoods don't change, if the drug war continues on the same course it's been on for decades now, I don't see Bloods and Crips and other violent street gangs going away. Let's pop out and talk about all this a little bit more. Good job, soldier. You've made it back. Barely. Bloods and Crips founded by some teenagers from South LA, South Los Angeles, South Central, who weren't allowed to uh, join any more positive-minded groups, you know, or any, yeah, more positive-minded groups like uh, Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, young teens who'd grown up under the harsh racial profiling, all the rest you for being black if you step outside of your neighborhood conditions of LAPD police chief William Grand Dragon Parker, right? That dude can rot in hell. Uh, these teens initially wanted to protect their friends and maybe their communities from rival gangs in different neighborhoods, or maybe just prove to themselves how hard and tough they were. Or maybe to feel fucking good about something, to feel like they mattered. Also wanted to belong to a community, to a family. So many came from broken homes. All came from neighborhoods. Not wanted by the city around them. Broken neighborhoods. At first, early South Central street members, uh, or gang, street, street gang members, my God, engaged in petty crimes like street fighting, stealing. But then that quickly evolved into much more serious crimes like murder. In either 1969 or 1971, Raymond Washington, Stanley Tukey Williams found the Crips, an alliance between Fremont and Washington High School gang members, Washington recruited more members by uh, fighting rival gangs, absorbing members into his group. Bloods were formed as a direct response. And then, you know, fucking some blondes, you know, or bloods, excuse me. Uh, they jerked off, you know, Washington and some other Crips and they rolled them out a big hill in giant tires after gluing their dicks together. And that didn't fucking help anything. That escalated things. So don't forget about that. Don't you fucking ever forget about doing that. People did that. No. Uh, gangs on Pirate Street and Compton felt threatened by the Crips after several attacks, joined together to form their own alliances. They distinguished themselves from the Crips by uh, having, you know, completely uh, untorn dicks, you know, full dicks that weren't rolled down hills. No, by wearing red, uh, coming with their, uh, coming up with their own coded gang signs. The violence quickly spiraled out of control, outmanned, blood started to bring guns to street fights to win their battles. These teenagers and young men began using guns all the time now, committing, you know, more and more violent crimes instead of fist fights, right? They're shooting each other instead of dealing with the root of the problem, which started back in the 1950s with LAPD's policing policies and an economic and cultural shift. Law enforcement focuses on continual arrests. Legislators start sending nonviolent gang members to prison for lengthy sentences, removing more young men from the streets and from their families, making it harder for them to get straight jobs once they're released. Cycle of gang life and violence intensifies. 1979, the Crips experienced a major shift. Stanley Williams arrested, charged with four murders. Raymond Washington shot and killed while standing on the street a few months later. It was the end of an era, the end of the unified Crips, which had actually already begun to unravel years earlier. In the 1980s, the Bloods and Crips joined the drug trade during the crack cocaine epidemic. They became uh, some of the main distributors for drug cartels, and the gangs expanded all around the country, upgraded their arsenals to automatic weapons with all the new crack profits, more innocent bystanders start dying in drive-bys. Today, every major city in the U.S., most of the small cities are home to Bloods, Crips, other gangs. Fighting continues between the Bloods and Crips. Thousands of young men are murdered, right? Over 15,000, I've said a few times, just in just Bloods and Crips gang violence just through 2009. Thousands and thousands more sent to prison for the rest of their lives. And not just for murder charges, for, for drugs, for nonviolent crimes, the same crimes that their white counterparts snorting coke instead of smoking crack are getting slaps on the wrist for. The gang culture was glorified in different rap songs and movies in the early 90s. Some of it depicted the realities and dangers of gang life. Some of it made people even more prejudiced against gang members and black men in America. Another major shift, half, shift happened in 1992. Bloods and Crips in LA come together to establish a historic truce just the day before the Rodney King riots break out. They promise to stop fighting and the violence that had begun plaguing their communities. The city of LA gives them hope, promises to create jobs, provide more community resources than ever before. And then those promises fall flat, just like promises before had fallen flat. Then the truce is eventually broken. It was never in full effect. Every year, Bloods and Crips were still dying and the gang violence intensifies and continues. And, and it'll never end. As long as they continue to sell the drugs, we choose to keep punishing people for taking so severely, as long as the U.S. Uh, continues to be the most punitive-minded society in the world. 
No one else puts as many people in prison for nonviolent crimes in America. No one puts as many people in prison, period. Not China, not Russia. As of July 2021, the U.S. has the highest number of incarcerated individuals worldwide with almost 2.1 million people in prison. Have the, have the highest total number of people in prison and also the highest per capita imprisonment rate. Imprisonment rate. 639 out of every 100,000 citizens are in prison. Almost exactly 25% of those prisoners are in for nonviolent drug charges. Almost 40% of all these prisoners are black, even though uh, the black population is only 14% of the overall population. Black men incarcerated in prison nearly five times the rate of white men. I'm, a fuck, I'm ashamed of these numbers. When are we going to wake up and get real about fixing all this shit instead of just cheering on politicians at rallies who talk about cleaning up the streets, just fucking hollow statements? We don't need to clean up the streets. We need to fucking fix the streets. We need to fill in the potholes, put down some new asphalt, build it back better, right? Maybe there will be uh, street gangs and gang violence no matter what we do as a culture, as a society, but we can for sure do better with this ongoing problem than what we've done so far. Time now for today's top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. And I just realized that I, I think I stole that phrase from <laughs> build it back better from some politician. <laughs> we need to do more than give hollow phrases. though. Uh, number one, the blood and crypts were founded by high schoolers in the late sixties and early seventies in LA. Although today we think of gang members as grown men wielding guns and committing serious crimes. The original gangsters were teenagers who wanted to band together, to fend off neighborhood bullies. Many of them did nothing worse than engage in fist fights with their rivals. Number two, Crips founder, Ray Washington, Raymond came to power in the late sixties after breaking off from the avenues gang. Started his own gang, Baby Avenues. Used his fighting skills to recruit new members. Washington approached and fought rival gang leaders. Once he won the fight, he absorbed the gang into his own. But he didn't fight co-founder, co-founder of the Crips, Stanley Tukey Williams. That dude, just as tough as he was. And those two formed an alliance that formed the basis for one of the most powerful street gangs in the history of the U.S. Number three, many factors led to the formation of modern street gangs in South Central L.A. The main causes were economics, racism, LAPD police practices, and a lack of resources for young people. In the 60s and 70s, South LA's economy suffered from a lack of job opportunities after so many factories, primarily automotive, moved out of the area. Racial, uh, racist housing and policing pro- uh, practices kept black people confined to certain areas of the city. Uh, these areas were impoverished, underfunded, with little to no resources to take up young people's free time. And they became severely overcrowded. And then young people living there joined together to protect themselves from the police and from rival gangs that were harassing them and also to create new criminal economic opportunities for themselves. Number four, original Crips co-founder, Stanley Tukey Williams, was executed by the state of California on December 13th, 2005. Despite multiple appeals, flaws in the investigation and trial, as well as his efforts to completely change his life, former governor Arnold Schwarzenegger denied Williams' final clemency request, partially on the basis that he never admitted guilt in the four murders he was convicted of committing. Number five, new info, Let's talk a bit about gang-affiliated celebrities. Several high-profile uh, high celebrities have admitted to or are suspected of being affiliated with gangs in recent years. I'm going to list just a small handful. There are many others. Uh, Gary Busey, uh, Paul Rubens, also known as Pee Wee Herman, Will Ferrell. No, uh, Chris Brown has been associated with members of the Fruit Pyru Bloods. In July 2014, Chris Brown made several Instagram posts possibly referencing the Bloods, even referenced the gang during some concerts. Uh, Chris Brown uh, captioned a now deleted Instagram picture of his shoes, replacing the letter C with the letter B in the post, just like actual blood members often do, right? Writing, it's bull. I stand on my own two feet when life gets brazy. Uh, Chris Brown also seen, th- th- uh, also seen throwing gang signs at a BET after party and shouted out the Fruits Pyru gang. Insiders say that he affiliates himself with the Bloods, but is not a member. And sources told TMZ that the Bloods approve of Chris Brown claiming membership because he hired some of them to work for him and has helped uh, them out in their in the Compton neighborhood. Earlier this year, uh, Brown uh, himself publicly claimed uh, blood affiliation. Uh, Nick Cannon, loosely involved with the Bloods as a teenager, he said in an interview with Vlad TV, I wouldn't say I joined a gang. I grew up in a neighborhood in Southeast San Diego, this public assistance area called Bay Vista. And that was kind of the thing. Actually, if anything, I was always trying to get away from it. Of course, during the early 90s, when it was glorified, I definitely was wearing my Dickies in certain colors and the Chucks. It was a blood set, but it was one of those things where that's the area that I grew up in. I mean, even if you think of South uh, East San Diego, the majority of the people from down there are from dri- different blood sets. I lost a lot of friends to senseless gang violence. A lot of people still locked up right now. So I always try to downplay it and be like the cat that was uh, allowed to get away from it. 
Uh, rappers Lil Wayne, Young Thug, Birdman, also uh, allegedly affiliated with Bloods. Some Bloods were accused of attempting to murder Lil Wayne. Rolling Stone obtained court documents to describe uh, the three artists as Bloods members and alleged that Jimmy Carlton Winfrey, Young Thug's tour manager, was a high-ranking Blood who fired shots at Lil Wayne's tour bus in April of 2015. Winfrey was indicted. The indictment alleged that Winfrey made a threat in Young Thug's halftime video, which shows him holding a weapon similar to the one used in the shooting. Allegedly, Young Thug threatened uh, Lil Wayne on Instagram before the shooting. Lil Wayne has referenced the Bloods throughout his entire career. In a 2016 interview with Nightline, Lil Wayne pulled out a red bandana at one point and said, I'm connected to this motherfucking flag right fucking here. I'm connected. I'm a gangbanger. I'm connected. Some Bloods members have uh, come out, though, and said that he's full of shit and a fake gangster not associated with any blood set. He's just doing it for publicity. Uh, who knows? Uh, growing up, Ice-T was loosely affiliated with the Crips in the Crenshaw neighborhood. Ice-T once said in an interview with the AV Club, you're either with them or without them. You kind of get indoctrinated into that lifestyle. Like I say on one of my records, whether you're in a gang or not, you know what color to wear. You don't want to wear the wrong color just to cause a problem. Gangs are real. They fight to the death. He claims he was never fully initiated into the gang, but pretended like he was, saying we actually created a fake gang. We told people we were part of the Hillside Crips. We had them think that there was hundreds of us. We connected together. This kind of kept people off of us. By 10th grade, you start to know people from the different neighborhoods. I've always, had, I've always had a very cool, charismatic personality, and as long as you meet the shot callers and the troublemakers and they like you, you ain't got no problems. Snoop Dogg has never hid the fact that he is uh, affiliated with Crips. 2017, he released an LP titled Make America Crip Again. He told Vibe Magazine, what I mean by that is, in my lifetime, that's when young black men in impoverished areas organized to help their communities and to take care of their own because society basically left them for dead. A lot of people glorify the gang banging and violence, but forget that in the beginning, the Crip's main and sole purpose was to be the reflection of the Black Panthers. They looked after kids, provided after school activities, fed them, stepped in as role models and father figures. And I didn't come across uh, Snoop's claim about that. I know the Black Panthers did that. I don't know that the early Crips did looking after the kids stuff. But, you know, that doesn't mean it didn't happen. Snoop's a smart, Snoop's a smart dude. He's from there. I'll, uh, I'll take his word for it. Cardi B has admitted to associating with Bloods as a teen. And in 2018, she told GQ, when I was 16 years old, I used to hang out with a lot of Bloods. Sometimes it's almost like a fraternity, a sorority. Sometimes I see people that's in the same gang kill each other. So sometimes there is no loyalty. Sometimes you got to do certain things to get hired, to get higher and higher. You're doing all of that and you're not making any money off it. That's why I don't talk about it much uh, because I wouldn't want a young person, a young girl to think it's okay to join it. And finally, Tupac Shakur murdered in a drive-by shooting, as we talked about in the, an episode I did a long time ago about that, September 7th, 1996, right? It was uh, episode uh, 76. According to the LAPD, Suge Knight, founder of Death Row Records, was affiliated with the mob Pyru Bloods and Knight's association with that gang led to the murder of Tupac. When Tupac signed with Death Row, he immediately was on the wrong side of certain Crips, right? All Crips, I guess. Uh, on the day Tupac was killed, he got into a scuffle with the Crip member, Orlando Anderson. Uh, it was a simple retaliation. You mess with one of ours, we will mess with one of yours. If Orlando had never been jumped in the hotel, they would have never killed Tupac that night. Immediately after Tupac was shot, uh, the next day there were murders all the way back in LA because the Compton mob, Pyro, which Shug was a part of, knew that the South Side Compton Crips were involved, uh, said in the article. And, uh, in fall of 1995, when Tupac signed with Death Row Records, owned by Suge Knight, right, he became affiliated with gangs in California. At the time of the signing, Tupac was in prison for sexually abusing a 19-year-old fan. Suge offered to finance Tupac's appeal if he agreed to produce three records for him. Um, it, according to an unnamed LAPD source, Shakur wanted to get out of jail. He basically signed his life away to Suge. He didn't want to do it, but when he does that, they own him. Mob Pyru was built off of Death Row. They've been around for a while, but Suge uh, put them on the map and they started making money and became big. According to LA Times, Orlando Anderson was the one who shot Tupac. The police did not consider him a suspect, interviewed him and, and oh, I'm sorry. The police, yeah, did not consider him a suspect though. Uh, Anderson was killed on May 29th, 1998 at a car wash in Compton. According to the Times, a notorious B.I.G. supplied the murder weapon, paid the Crips a million dollars to kill Tupac. An LAPD source later confirmed with People Magazine that a Crips leader admitted Tupac's murder was retaliation for that fight. It was simple retaliation. You mess with one of ours, we'll mess with one of yours. And, uh, and there you go for the top five takeaways. Time suck. Top five takeaways. This uh, Blood and Crips, America's deadliest gang rivalry has been sucked. Sorry if there was a couple little like uh, pauses here and there. Had to get past a lot of sources links as I scrolled through the notes. We uh, Pulled from uh, more sources than normal to try and put all this together this week. Uh, fascinating, sad, 
Doesn't have to be sad forever though, right? We can change the way we regulate our society. We can learn from our mistakes, make better choices going forward. And that's supposed to be the goal of life. We can keep fighting uh, the ignorance that led to the old mistakes by continuing to educate ourselves and by being open to change, not getting locked into fixed mindsets. So I hope that happens. Uh, Thank you as always to everyone involved, starting with the queen of bad magic, Lindsay Cummins. Thanks to Logan Keith, uh, the art warlock for directing and producing today. And I'm pretty sure he did throw up the gang sign first. He was the fastest. So... I'm not, I don't want to put a target on his back. <laughs> I know I'm not saying that, but you know, I don't know if it's me or him and someone's mad about it. I mean, like he did it kind of first, you know, uh, the suck ranger, Tyler C. Thanks to him for help with production from uh cut and clips for, uh, from the episode for socials. Thanks to uh bit elixir for upkeep on the time. <laughs> I'm so stupid. I just keep thinking about, uh, Fucking the guys getting tying the wieners together. I don't know why that's popping in my head all over, over and over again today. Uh, thanks to Art Warlock and Logan Keith again for creating the merch at badmagicmerch.com and for helping run our socials along with our Suck Ranger, Tyler C., and a team managed by our social media strategist, Ryan Handelsman. I also thought about me just throwing the stupid improv of like, you know, uh, Logan doing it first. I don't know, my mind all of a sudden flashed to uh, Talladega Nights. Don't you put that evil on me, Rick and Bobby. <laughs> uh, thanks to producer Sophie Evans again with the initial research this week. And, oh my gosh, I did not update that. Sorry, uh, in my notes, it was uh, Olivia Lee. Gotta give credit where credit's due. Thanks to Olivia Lee. Sophie, uh, uh, or wait a minute. Yes, Olivia Lee did the research this week. My God, I don't know why my brain's shorting out right now. Thanks to the All Seeing Eyes, moderating the Cult of Curious private Facebook page, Mod Squad for making sure Discord keeps running smooth, and everyone over on the Time Suck subreddit and the Bad Magic subreddit. Next week, since it is October, time for another true crime episode. All right, I'll be sharing the tale of the vicious harps a.k.a. the Bloody Harps. The Harp Brothers, considered to be America's first documented serial killers. Uh, McKaja, Big Harp, and Wiley, Little Harp, were murderous outlaws who operated in Tennessee, Kentucky, Illinois, and Mississippi in the late 1700s, long time ago. Often referred to as the Harp Brothers, they were actually cousins who passed themselves off as brothers. Growing up near each other, the boys soon took up the nicknames of Big and Little Harp because, you know, one was a lot bigger than the other. Makes sense. Two left North Carolina in 1775 for Virginia, intending to find jobs as slave overseers. However, the American Revolution changed their life plans or their life's plans. The pair sided with the British, but their interests seemed to be uh, more in violence and criminal activities than it was in any sense of duty to either side. Along with other like-minded irregulars, they apparently thrilled in the activities of burning farms, raping women, and pillaging American patriots. When Little Harp attempted to rape a girl in North Carolina, he was shot and wounded by Captain James Wood. Unfortunately, he survived. In late 1798, the Harps, after already committing several murders previously, went on a fucking crazy murder spree, one of the most violent in U.S. history. They first killed two men in Tennessee, and then they moved to Kentucky, killed a couple men there. Unlike most outlaws at the time, they seemed to be more motivated by bloodlust than financial gain, often leaving their victims disemboweled, doing sick shit like filling their abdominal cavities with rocks and sinking them in a river. Uh, next, they killed a man named John Langford, who was traveling from Virginia to Kentucky. He turned up dead. A local innkeeper pointed the authorities to the Harps. The criminal pair was then pursued, captured, jailed in Danville, Kentucky, but then managed to escape. When a posse was sent after them, the young son of a man who assisted the authorities was found dead and mutilated, and their murder spree just kept on going and going and going. And I'll share all the gory details next week. Right now, let's head on over to this week's Time Sucker Updates. Updates. Get your time, sucker updates. Before we get started with this, Logan, do you want to say anything about the gang signs? Uh, no, no comment. <laughs> uh, starting off with an interesting update from an anonymous uh, lawyer regarding last week's suck, where I talked about how I couldn't just sit on uh, those confessions, you know, those, those tapes that PJK gave his attorney, uh, Sh- uh, Shady Sheldon, Sheldon Yavitz, tapes where Paul confessed to multiple murders. And then he left Yavitz's office, you know, to continue on with a, a murder spree. And our anonymous Texas law sack writes, Hey, Dan and team. First, I'm a divorce attorney in Dallas, Texas. I prefer that my name is not disclosed if this ends up in a time sucker update because of the story I'm sharing. Also won't include any identifying details of the people involved because of confidentiality reasons. When you mentioned that Paul John Knowles attorney Sheldon Yavitz didn't disclose the confession tapes for ethics reasons, I was reminded of an ethical dilemma I faced and how I got out of it. As attorneys, we're prohibited from disclosing clients past crimes and can only notify the authorities if we become aware that a client is planning a future crime that will result in harm or we suspect child abuse. I see some sad shit as a divorce attorney and have no outlet because of my ethical constraints. Your podcast helps with that, so thank you. My firm was contacted by an individual at the center of a violent Amber Alert. The child had not been located and the police were actively searching. Ethically, there was nothing we could do. 
until the individual notified my office that he was planning to take the child to Mexico and wanted help in doing that. I personally consider that to be a future crime with a high likelihood of harm. We scheduled an in-person meeting and notified the police. The individual was successfully taken into custody and the police never shared where the tip came from to protect our firm from any potential ethical implications. Fuck yeah, I love that you did that. Tail Nimrod. In law school, we were taught that when you're faced with an ethical problem, decide what Jesus would do and do the next best thing. I'm an atheist. That didn't really help me much, but I thought I would share. P.S. Thank you for your humor. I commute to work and your bit on slow drivers charred remains. (laughs) Serving as reminders to other drivers (laughs) crosses my mind almost daily. Anonymous. Well, uh, thank you, Anonymous Attorney. I I forgot about that stand-up bit. I'll have to hear this album. I hadn't thought about it in a long time. Uh, Again, awesome job for on what you did. You saved this kid from who knows what. Uh, what law school did you go to, by the way, where, uh, you know, they would just tell you as lawyers to do what, what Jesus would do or the next best thing. That's interesting. Uh, I like, I like, yeah, though, like we did that client. Yavitz uh, could have done the same thing. It seems uh, since PJK, right, was in the middle of a murder spree, like he was actively going to cause more people harm. I just don't think he fucking cared. Good on you for caring. I can sadly imagine all the horrible shit you must hear uh, doing what you do and with children involved. Yeah. I bet you also help a lot of good people like you did in this situation, get away from uh, terrible situations. And that has to feel great. So hold on to those moral victories when you're having a tough day. Next update from Gabrielle Phillips. Fantastic sack inspired by another fantastic sack who was the subject of an update last week when super sack Ken Sternberg shared the story of his beautiful 16-year-old brother tragically dying, but also sharing his organs and saving multiple lives. And Gabby writes, my time sucker Lord, the story of organ donation from last week's episode really touched me. I'm currently in nursing school and this podcast has really helped me throughout school from late night studying to working insane 12 hour shifts right after clinical. I'm going to suck your dick a bit here. I don't apologize, but you've always made me laugh and given me something to look forward to as the days mush together from school. I saw mush and I thought you were going somewhere else there. Uh, That story reminds me of why I'm in in school, being able to hear stories of organ donation and seeing family members just uh, thankful for us healthcare workers really reminds me of why I'm in school. I would like to give my deepest condolences to him and his family. I can't even imagine how they must feel. I just want to say thank you to him for making me really see why I'm in this program. The donation walk makes me cry every time I think about it. The countless lives he saved, and even though, and even through his family's pain, they are still appreciative of what can happen with organ donation. Sometimes I sit and wonder if I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm young. I'm a 21-year-old female. I could do many easier things with my life. But now I realize this is really for me. Thank you for everything and making me realize I'm in school for the right reasons. I can never thank you enough. Sorry for the long message, but it's late and I'm long-winded with much love, Gabby. I fucking love your message, Gabby. Yes, yes, yes. What you're doing is so damn important. You're going to help save lives. You're going to help people feel safe when they feel the most scared they've ever felt. You're going to soothe souls in their final moments, help their families through the most difficult moments of their lives. What you are going to be doing is so noble. So thank you for sticking with that path instead of something easier, like fucking, I don't know, OnlyFans, <laughs> which I guess, you know, suits people in different ways. But uh, I think what you're doing is a lot more important. Uh, Hail Nimrod. Now, uh, Young Buck and Curious Sack Jason has some thoughts to share as to why serial killers do what they do. Uh, why did I say, sorry, I read uh, I read this wrong. Jaron, J-A-R-O-N, but pronounced Jaron, not Jason at all. Uh, and Jaron writes, hi, Dan, my name is Jaron. I'm a 19-year-old college student from Jacksonville, Florida. I love the podcast, listen to it constantly in the car. And while I'm working at an ice rink as a Zamboni driver, yes, I'm a Zamboni driver in Florida. I listen so frequently to the stuff from, my, from the podcast will sometimes get caught in my head. My girlfriend recently got a Cocker Spaniel puppy. I narrowly caught myself from making a joke about sacrificing it to Nimrod in front of her parents. I should have went for it. Anyways, I've listened to a lot of the serial killer episodes recently and I've heard you mention the McDonald triad and its association with violent behavior multiple times, though the link between the two has never been fully proven as I've yet talked about. I have my own theory about the link between the triad and serial killers based on psychology classes I've taken in high school and college. Freud theorized five psychosexual stages in children that if not fully developed lead to certain personality traits later in life. The ones most relevant here are the anal stage and phallic stage development which uh, span years one to six in a child's life. The anal stage is from one to three and is associated with the child trying to gain control over their bowels. Real or perceived parental bullying during this stage, along with other factors, can cause a fixation in the kid Freud called anal expulsive. This happens when stress from parents and other things causes a lack of control over the bladder and bowels. That would explain the continual bedwetting many violent criminals display. According to Freud, anal expulsive people also tend to exhibit cruelty, general carelessness, and disorganization. 
which can explain the cruelty and lack of emotion towards animals. The phallic stage occurs in years three to six and is associated with kids exploring sexuality and gender differences. Once again, parents who are overbearing or intolerant of a child's sexual development during the stage can lead to a phallic fixation. People with this fixation tend to have warped ideas around sexual pleasure, sexual aggression, and in males, often a hatred of women. I believe this sexual confusion is what may link uh, or what may lead to odd kinks, such as the strange attraction towards fire and violence, as well as sexual the sexual motivation most of the serial killers that have been sucked seem to display. As you can tell, I take more of a nurture approach to how a person turns out. I know you have a psychology degree and may have thought of these possibilities already, but I thought it would be cool to give you my own take on the why behind serial killings. Uh, thanks for the great content. Hail Nimrod, Jaron Danes. Well, thank you for your thoughts, Jaron Danes. It's been a fucking long time since I studied Freud. I had not thought of those possibilities. And I know I know a lot of people, uh, you know, in more recent decades are not big fans of Freud and have discounted a lot of his work. But fucking who knows? You could be right. Right. It is so strange to think that uh, how we're treated when we're so young, six and under, can so greatly shape our behavior for the rest of our lives. I have, you know, almost no memories before the age of six. Just a handful of little snapshots. Uh, I know, I, I know just from, you know, family history, I saw, uh, both a lot of love and a lot of discord at that age. A lot of my grandparents, uh, you know, doting on me. Uh, my parents also both loving each other, but then fighting like crazy. A lot of my dad being gone. I wonder how that all scrambled my noodle. Luckily, not enough to send me on a murderous path. I do love women's bodies so much, especially the shape of their butts. My wife loves to tell people that, uh, my butt or her, my butt, her butt is what drew me, uh, in and she's not wrong. Uh, just, you know, right, first, first, uh, first thing, uh, was I destined to be an ass man because of something that happened to me before I turned seven, some kind of fucking anal fixation. I don't know. Who knows? So much mystery still with our species. Thanks for giving us more to think about. And last one now from a fellow podcaster and marvelous meat sack, Josh Fink, sending in an eye catching subject line of the perseverance fairy has anal warts. Got my attention. And he wrote, hello, Dan, sorry for the crazy email header, but I wanted to get your attention. Well, you did. Uh, first off, uh, I like, uh, first off, I like so many want to thank you for all that you do. I'm very inspired by all that you and the crew do, uh, bad magic productions. I'm a bad magician through and through after discovering time suck three years ago, saw you in Boston, wanted to reach out and say, thanks for all that you do. I was at the Friday night, seven 30 show. <laughs> I yelled out, you going to sleep soon. I swear you blushed for a second. I did still a little embarrassed by that. Uh, that was a major life goal achieved right there. You started off one joke with, we need to have a new Holocaust. <laughs> I did. And I, as a Jewish guy in the audience, started to lose it. I have a lot of trust in your comedy and I wasn't disappointed. I took it to a good place. Uh, also, I was the guy who sent the shirt back to the green room for you. Thank you for that. Uh, I did get that. And that's why I wanted to reach out. I found your comedy through your podcast. I've been so impressed and taken in by all of them that I started a podcast with my two friends. That's the shirt I sent back. Uh, it's called The Steam Gentleman, based on a typo of mine. And the premise is pop culture and social commentary. In a lot of ways, the show emphasizes much of what you talked about in your act. Um, white and Jewish, ethically not religious. My two co-hosts are black. We all grew up very differently, but we all have uh, pop culture in common. We watch the same movies uh, on VHS over and over. We like comics and video games, the same ones. Find the same things funny. And that's why making this podcast has been so fun or so great. Sorry. I went to film school, spent some time in LA, but due to anxiety and depression that was untreated at the time and really not liking LA, moved back to my hometown here in Boston or in the Boston area. But because of seeing how you uh, started Time Suck in your apartment in Santa Monica and listening to some of the early episodes, I got the courage to start this. It's been a huge blessing. I'll leave a link to the show. I also understand you're crazy busy. And because I listened to this uh, week's Scared to Death already, I know you're headed back to Boston. Enjoy the trip. Yeah, I'm going to be taking off uh, in an hour or two for the airport. Hope you find a school you guys like. Yep, looking at schools for Kyler. Uh, uh, if you do have a few spare moments, can I ask you what advice you'd have as far as marketing for a small podcast like mine? Don't take me wrong. I know there's no substitute for the grind, but it's a big market. Excuse me. And I would very much appreciate the benefit of your experience. I went to Emerson College and Spike Lee spoke at our graduation. I'll never forget how he talked about how he couldn't give a young filmmaker the secrets in the time it took uh, a walk signal to change. So I get it. Uh, but I would very much appreciate everything you have to say. My dream is to be the first show you hire to be part of the Bad Magic Podcast Network. I know that's not in the plans right now, but who knows? I'll close this out by telling you how much uh, I love the story about the Perseverance Ferry. That's just a bit I've been doing at the end of my act lately. Uh, my motto has been for a long time, keep moving forward. And that story uh, just seems to embody that. Yeah, if I look back there, may have been some parked cars. that got a little banged up, but put the seatbelt on and just keep moving forward. Thanks again for all that you do. Three out of five stars. Wouldn't change a thing. Space Lizard, Annabelle, and Junior Perseverance Fairy, Joshua Fink. 
Well, Joshua, thank you for the t-shirt. Uh, again, I uh, appreciate it. And thanks again for coming to the show. And congrats on going to Emerson. That's a great school. Uh, I did listen to uh, like the first half of your most recent episode, man. Talking about slasher films, sound quality, chemistry. Excellent. Like the music you use to flow into the show. The intro's solid. Logo artwork is so good. Congrats on already getting ads. Heard, heard one at the start of the show. That's big. Uh, uh, agree about Winona Ryder. She has aged fantastically. Also love her in Stranger Things. Uh, as far as, as advice, um, you know, for marketing, get active on social media if you're not already, especially TikTok. Uh, we're going to be uh, getting active on t- TikTok with uh, Time Suck and Scared to Death. That platform has the most growth potential right now. Uh, you, you can't ever sleep on trying to find new listeners any way you can. Uh, record a video version of what you're doing, even if it's, um, you know, a little GoPros, whatever. Um, put little teaser clips out on socials, you know, Instagram as well. You just never know what clip might get passed around to help you find new listeners. Hopefully you can get like a YouTube version. Some people take off that way, especially when they have a podcast, uh, built on, you know, a lot of conversation. Biggest marketing tip, reach out to other podcasts, getting started like you podcasts that you like podcasts that might have audiences around the same size as yours and do some free cross promotions, right? You introduce them to your audience. They introduce you, uh, you know, your show to their audience. Don't be afraid to do this. A lot of podcasters hate this. They get so fucking insecure and afraid. They get afraid that their fans are going to like the new show more than their show and they're going to leave. But if that was true, if that possibility was true, uh, if your show is that dismissible, well, they're going to leave pretty quick anyway. So there's actually very little risk in introducing them to other shows. They know that other shows are out there. Uh, Believe in your show. Believe you can hold your audience. Finally, give it everything you fucking have, right? Nothing will spread your show like quality content. Right, I probably uh, pay extra attention on to like the notes because I know that no matter how good I make them, my mouth is going to betray me. Uh, but yeah, make sure that you're improving. Uh, listen to episodes. Make sure your mic technique is good. The listeners aren't struggling to hear you. Make sure you're not talking over your co-host, vice versa, which I don't. You don't seem to be. Make sure you record in advance to uh, avoid missing episodes. Right, give your audience a show they can depend on. You want to be uh, uh, worth their time. You want them to know they can trust you to deliver escapist entertainment each and every week that they can look forward to. And if you can't do that, you know, they'll find someone else who can. And good luck. You know, Perseverance Fairy, it is a fucking tough field and there's a lot of people out there, but uh, you got the right passion. You know, you, um, you're taking it seriously and so you've given yourself a chance. And may Nimrod guide you to glory. Keep going. Stick with it. And, uh, you know, uh, if you're so new to the game, even if this podcast doesn't become the one that you want it to be, well, the next one might. You can learn from, uh, you know, it and try again. We learn more from failures often than we do from successes, which is, you know, why the Crips got so strong. As I talked about earlier, when those guys had their wieners ripped off, like the tips, you know, it made them fucking tougher. And that's that's how it, I'll stop. Uh, Hill Nimrod and enjoy that awesome uh, city of yours. And thanks everybody for sending in the messages. Thanks time, suckers. I needed that. We all did. Another Bad Magic Productions podcast is done. Please don't join a street gang this week. Uh, try to do something different. I don't know. Try to get into uh, college instead. Maybe study politics. Maybe try and change the system that leads people to feeling so hopeless that they feel like the best choice they can make for themselves is to join a street gang. Or, if not at the very least, keep on sucking. <laughs> Add Magic Productions. I just want to take a second to try and explain what I was trying to do with the uh, wieners getting ripped off uh, references. I was very, I was very late when I came up with that concept, and I, I don't think I delivered it well. But I just, all I wanted to do was just put a scenario in your mind where one gr- gang, one group of guys, one gang, right? They fucking beat another group of guys, and instead of just leaving it at that, they fucking take their pants off. And they jerk them off until they come, and they, so their wieners are soft. And they make them stand facing each other because it's just, you know, just the visual of that. Just imagine on the streets, these guys are like, they got beaten up. But then, I guess they were kind of happy for a second because they came, but then they're fucking tired now. But then they're being forced to face each other, just, you know, four guys in a little circle. And they're somehow their wieners are stretched out, as if you can do that. And then there's like super glue, just glues them together in the middle. And it's like a, like a, bicycle like spokes in the middle now they're like they're like a tire in a way and then they're put inside of these giant tires and those tires are glued together and rolled down a hill 
and just imagine seeing that and then the fucking tires go ripping apart and then the guys are cutting, they get their wieners get torn as they you know fly apart and then it you know just fucking piss them off and then ray the the leader who's never lost a fight before you know and then he gets on a horse <laughs> too and he's a guy who rides horses who has not a full wiener and i probably should put i could i probably should put more work into it but i just wanted you to know that i was laughing really hard when i first came up with it and i i just apologize if it didn't translate and the last thing i want to say is i know i said it a few times already but logan he did it first he did the sign first that's just an important thing to remember at the end of the episode I want to do it, but I'm not going to do it. Logan might be doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs>